So yeah, thank you. Um, so this is the uh, second annual NIH Synthetic Biology Consortium meeting. Um, unfortunately, we did not have one last year uh, due to COVID restrictions. Um, and so we did have our first one back in 2019 uh, at the NIH campus. And I hope we get the opportunity to welcome you all back to campus again uh, a year from now. So, um, you know, this, um, this meeting is really designed to give the SynBio community some resources and opportunities that it might not normally get it at the, all the other um, synthetic biology meetings that are held every year. Uh, there's no shortage of awesome synthetic biology meetings all over the country and the world. And so um, when you come here, you know, I, I hope what you can take away is a little bit more about how you might see your work fitting within uh, the NIH mission and giving you some of the tools that you might need to um, approach us and, and have success. So um, we've got two half days today, uh, uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and so let me go to the next slide. So just at the top there, uh, it's already in the chat um, window as well, but that's where you can go and find the agenda if you'd like to see it. Um, and then, so what we have up uh, in store for the next two days, uh, we're gonna start off with um, two parallel sessions. One is specifically designed for uh, trainees to give them a sense of some of the um, opportunities that were really specific to the trainee, postdoc, uh, graduate student community uh, here at the NIH. And the other parallel session is gonna be a little bit more technically focused to talk about a new uh, synthetic biology and cancer program. Uh, that has recently been started uh, between NCI and the NIBIB. Uh, later today, we're gonna do a little more networking with NIH program staff. Again, to hope, hopefully give you the opportunity to hear about our missions and think a little bit about how your work might fit uh, within one of many different institutes within the NIH. Um, and then day two is gonna largely be focused on translating SynBio innovations into biomedical products. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, more folks in the synthetic biology community who are working on translating their own innovations. Um, and we're going to end the day tomorrow uh, with, with uh, some of my colleagues at the FDA who are going to give us a little bit of uh, FDA 101. What was that? So, sorry, I, I heard something come back. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit of what we have in store. So I just wanna do um, a couple quick thank yous so we can get right into um, our sessions and give us as much time as we can take in these uh, two short half days. Um, so here are all of the um, uh, uh, researchers from the external research community who are uh, volunteering their time and effort to uh, be a part of this meeting. So I just, I'm not gonna read all their names, but thanks to all of you who, um, are gonna tell us all the cool things that you're up to in your labs. Um, and thank you to the synthetic biology community in general for being a part of this meeting. Um, you know, we really try to make this a meeting for you. Um, and so I hope you enjoy it. And then uh, another, another set of thank yous to all the people who are inside the, the, the federal envelope here. And this is a list of all the people from the NIH that you're going to get a chance to interact with today and, and, and potentially tomorrow and other days if you reach out to them. Um, and in particular, I wanted to say thank you to my colleagues at the FDA, who you'll hear uh, from tomorrow. Uh, Infinity Conference Group uh, has been a tremendous resource in helping us get this conference going. Uh, you've heard from Holly uh, quite a bit. And, and so lastly, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to Julia who I think all of you who have interacted with at some point in time over the last six odd months getting this conference off the ground. And without her, there would absolutely be no conference at all. And so um, I don't know what approximates a thunderous applause in a virtual environment, but um, like whatever that looks like, you know, please give it up for Julia because there's absolutely nothing. Yeah, this would be nothing without her help. So thank you, Julia. And so, um, I am going to stop sharing my screen. All right, I think I'll go ahead and get us started then. So thanks so much for being here and I wanna reiterate Dave's welcome and um, thanks for joining us for the Synthetic Biology Consortium. 
And I'm really pleased today that we get to introduce this brand new synthetic biology and cancer program that was just launched this fall as a collaboration between the National Cancer Institute that I'm representing and NMBIB. So my name is Michelle Bernie Lang, and I'm a program director from the National Cancer Institute. So before we dive into the, the scientific research that we're going to hear about from the members of the program, I just wanted to start with a little bit of background. So with all things um, NIH, it can take a little while for things to develop from idea to final program. So about two years ago, leadership in NCI and in NABIB started talking together, recognizing that they had a lot of areas of interest in common and could really develop some potential opportunities at the, um, to bring more engineers to cancer research. And as we honed in on this more, we started to take a deeper look into the synthetic biology portfolio across NIH. And as you'll hear about throughout this meeting, there is a lot of different um, synthetic biology that has been bubbling up across the different components of the NIH institutes and centers, with NIBIB being one of the big supporters of the investigators and the approaches. And as we took a deeper dive into the NCI portfolio, we really recognized that we had a smaller footprint than we were hoping to have. We had some successful approaches with early technology development, some work in the uh, immunoengineering space, and some work in the engineering of bacterial systems. But it was something that we were looking to expand, and we thought by joining forces with NIBIB, we could really start to bring some of those investigators and approaches that they had been supporting and have them applied to cancer research. And so to do this, we put together a program designed to bring in collaborative teams with a wide spanning expertise. So representing engineering, synthetic biology, cancer research and cancer care, and in many cases, computational and mathematical modeling. What we were hoping those groups would do is to identify important and challenging questions in cancer research that could be addressed through synthetic biology. And ideally finding questions that maybe we couldn't address through our current approaches or through our current means that might be uniquely suited for synthetic biology. And with that, the program, the Synthetic Biology and Cancer Program was launched just this fall. So it's comprised of six U01 Cooperative Agreement Awards, and I'll get into more details about um, those awards and their research focus on the next slide. And we're intending for this to be very collaborative, both collaborative and interactive among the awardees, where they can share their technologies, their model systems, I think really set some pathways for where the field is going as a whole. And then we're also interested in um, broader collaborations across the entire NIH synthetic biology network. So you see this program highlighted at this meeting today. And as you in your synthetic biology worlds hear what this program is doing and some of the different approaches and plans for these investigative teams, I really encourage you to think about what types of collaborations you might be interested in pursuing. We'd really be happy to help facilitate those and are even working to develop an affiliate membership process to have more synthetic biology community involvement in this research program. And then beyond that, we're also looking to enhance the connections of the synthetic biology approaches with the NCI networks and programs. And we have a lot of long-standing programs and newly developed programs in areas like systems biology or immune oncology or treatment resistance. And would love to have these be a bigger component into those networks and consortia. So looking five years down the road, what we're really wanting to do is just demonstrate the power and the impact of synthetic biology and helping us have a better understanding of cancer and having new approaches to manage it. And really looking to expand how synthetic biology is readily integrated into cancer research and eventually into cancer research and care. If you want to learn a little bit more about what these plans have been, you can see the funding opportunity that launched this program. So moving on to my next slide, there we go. Our plan for today 
You're hearing the introduction now, and then we're going to have 10 minute presentations from each of the teams that have been awarded the, for this program. It'll be a pretty firm 10 minutes to ensure we have plenty of time for presentations. So I'll have to jump in and do some transition from presenter to presenter. We'll have an opportunity for very brief questions after each presenter. This could be a, a clarification or a brief technical question, but I think a lot of your meatier questions, it would be good to save for the panel discussion, which we'll have with all six awardees at the end. We have a couple questions queued up and then would be really eager to hear your input as well. So that's our plan and just quickly I'll dive into our speakers, but we're really excited about the range of approaches and the different ways that these groups are tackling cancer research questions and the different types of cancers that are uh, being focused on here. So we have approaches for colorectal cancer, how to detect and treat it early, ways to detect metastases in colorectal cancer, some immune system engineering approaches to really harness the immune system for better treatment of pancreatic, lung, and ovarian cancer, and then approaches to overcome treatment resistance in drug cancer. So I definitely encourage you to tune in and see where you might see connections between these projects and these awardees. And again, we're really happy to facilitate connections, collaborations, and the potential for affiliate membership into this program. So with that, I think you're really here to see the science and where these projects are going. I want to reiterate that these projects just started in the fall. So these are brand new projects, and I think you'll get to hear a lot of the premise behind their work, but won't necessarily have um, tons of results because these were just awarded um, just a, a month or so ago. So you'll get to hear where they're planning to go over the next five years of research and the research that they've done to support these plants. So I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter. We're just going to go down in order on the slide here. Our first presenter is Dr. Gabe Huang from Georgia Tech. You'll get to learn about their synthetic biology or their synthetic biomarker approaches to detect liver metastases. So Gabe, I'll let you go ahead and switch slides with me and start sharing. Great, thank you. All right, so um, we're, our team is very excited to uh, present here. So my name is Gabe Huang. Uh, we're from Georgia Tech Emory, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Peng Chu, who's uh, also MPI, as well as uh, Dr. M.G. Finn, who's chair of chemistry and biochemistry at Georgia Tech, who is a co-I. So our project is uh, focused on early detection of cancer with AND-gated synthetic biomarkers. And so the context of uh, the disclaimer and disclosure, so the context of early detection is that uh, we're, we're thinking about tumors that are currently very difficult to detect or below the limit of detection of imaging. And these are typically in situ uh, tumors that are several millimeters in diameter. And the real challenge for the field is that if you were to uh, design tests that look at tumor shed markers, there just aren't enough molecules in circulating blood to develop early detection tests, especially for stage one in situ cancers. And you know, for the context of like circulating tumor DNA, for example, uh, it's been estimated that a standard 10 mil blood draw will contain on average about five to six molecules of DNA that actually harbors the mutant allele. So this is a, uh, a huge challenge for the field. Now, uh, the idea of a synthetic biomarker approach is instead of looking at a shed marker that's diluted in blood and has all the limitations in terms of sensitivity I just mentioned about, the, the question that drives our research is, can we design sensors with different sense and respond components that we administer systemically, and then these sensors are turned on either by tumor cells or by the tumor microenvironment that then drive the release of a synthetic biomarker to levels that could potentially exceed what a standard tumor shed uh, biomarker could achieve. And so this can be done with uh, chemical probes, which are ones shown on the left. And you can think of these akin to contrast agents that you would administer uh, before you do uh, an, an, an image, uh, imaging cycle. But then there are also uh, different genetically encoded systems that have been reported, such as uh, engineered immune cells, as well as microbes, which of course is leveraging uh, the amazing advances that's happening in synthetic biology to amplify detection signals, as well as to improve specificity 
And again, by using uh, certain features of the tumor or the tumor microenvironment to drive the production of these synthetic biomarkers. So my lab and others across the country, uh, we've been advancing the idea of protease activated synthetic biomarkers. Uh, we like proteases for several reasons. Uh, the first is that proteases are, you know, the nature's molecular amplifiers, right? So like the, if you provide sufficient substrate within the microenvironment, they can catalyze the production of this signal over time that can exceed a standard uh, shed marker. Uh, the other aspect is there are many flavors of proteases. Uh, there are 550 proteases encoded by the genome and different subsets are dysregulated uh, not just across cancer types, but also across stage or response. And basically everywhere that we've looked, we've been able to identify proteases that are differentially expressed uh, within tumors. And so the idea here is with these protease activated synthetic biomarkers, we're designing different types of substrates. And uh, the beauty of using peptide-based uh, approaches is that there are well-established methods, for example, like barcoding using heavy amino acids uh, that proteomics um, uh, pioneers have already developed that we can leverage to, again, design these synthetic systems that can uh, drive sensitivity as well as specificity by looking at multiplex uh, probes uh, in vivo. So we've been working on this platform for a number of years. And so what have we learned? Well, we've learned that actually, indeed, you can engineer a diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. I think this, this paradigm is very different than, you know, just taking what nature provides and, you know, uh, uh, dealing with the sensitivity and specificity. The second point, which is uh, a focus of this U1 is tumor localization an early detection signal that cannot uh, predict or uh, tell the ph physician which organ to do follow-on studies is largely not that useful. And so if you look at the, uh, the cancer seek multi-cancer test assay or the, um, the, the, the GRAIL test that was just recently released, these are, their approach is basically measure as many things as you possibly can. And then you use AI or machine learning to help you predict not just whether cancer is present, but also where uh, the, the, the target, the origin of the, the organ may be. And so we're asking ourselves, well, are there more direct ways of telling uh, you where, the, um, where the, the early lesions may lie instead of looking at these um, you know, very high multivariate uh, tests? And the last point that we spent a lot of time thinking about is for each particular clinical use case, we have to be very careful about how we design our sensors to address the problem that we're looking at. So for example, in the context of screening, um, because disease prevalence is low and your PBV, your positive predictive value depends on the prevalence, you, would, you, you will need a very, very high specificity in order to uh, reduce the number of false positives. Uh, but for the context of this grant um, and our U1 project, we're actually focused on colorectal cancer liver mets. And because in primary cancer patients that are in remission, they are at significantly higher risk of de developing local liver mets, uh, which uh, when detected early can actually lead to favorable uh, treatment outcomes. Okay, so in the context of colorectal liver mets, we've done the exercise of looking at, you know, the proteases that are differentially expressed in these lesions compared to healthy adjacent tissue. But what's striking to us as well is that if you look at protease expression across healthy organs, we see this remarkable pattern where uh, healthy organs are expressing a unique subset of proteases. So the natural question for us was, can we design protease-based circuits that can integrate the information that we're seeing uh, from these liver mets, as well as potentially integrate information from healthy organs to, again, infer uh, where these liver mets may lie. And so we've explored the idea of protease-based circuits uh, in a few studies from my lab. And, you know, we're not the first to think of proteases as a bio bit, uh, but I just want to show, you know, what uh, kind of circuits are capable. And so we've designed these cell-free, gene-free uh, protease-based circuits where, you know, they can be fairly uh, integrated into um, uh, circuits such like an analog to a digital converter that I'm showing here where you can take input protease activity uh, on the x-axis and depending on, this is a four to two bit converter, uh, you can translate that into four bins. We've also asked for proteases that are promiscuous that can cut more than one substrate and the vast majority of enzymes are promiscuous because they carry out multiple functions. Can we also use that information? Is that useful? And it turns out, yes, you, it is useful information if you just don't think of them as a binary zero one, but you think of it as occupying um, anything from zero to one. So it's like a more like an analog signal. And we've built uh, correspondingly analog circuits that in this case can solve a math problem. So you use proteases uh, to basically solve the, 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 the two bit Oracle problem. If those, those of you who don't know the Oracle problem is just there's a black box that's hiding a string and your job is to basically guess or deduce what that value of the string is 
uh, in the fewest number of guesses. And so we, we solved that with proteases. Okay, so coming back to the U01, right now what we're asking is these type of protease-based circuitry, can we design them to do in vivo sensing? And our first implementation is we're gonna to try to build something as simple as possible for translational purposes. But uh, an AND gate could comprise, for example, like a cyclic peptide instead of a linear peptide, such that the reporter is released if and only if uh, both halves of the cyclic peptide is cleaved. And you know, we have early studies looking at um, uh, designing different types of AND gated sensors here, looking at uh, MMP and Granzyme B as the two inputs, and we can fill out the, uh, the biological truth table. And I think what's interesting to us is we, we're asking, well, what does it what does it represent biologically? And you know, for for example, in the context of T cells killing a target tumor cell, well, there could be four possible states if you um, if you just oversimplify the system. You could ask, well, are the tumor cells there? Are the T cells there? Are the tumors and T cells present? And the fourth condition is, are the T cells actually actively killing the tumor cells? And so with these very simple AND gated sensors, uh, as you can see uh, you know, for the data on the right, we can pick out the latter condition is that T cells are actively killing the tumor cells. Okay, so in the last 30 seconds or so, I just wanna give a super high level overview of where the project is going. Uh, the first is we're, we have plans to build out uh, larger libraries of these AND gated sensors, because as you can imagine, this is, this is a combinatorial problem, right? It's N choose two. There are many pairwise combinations of proteases that you can choose from. And so the idea here is uh, let's do a better job of picking out the best uh, protease pairs uh, to build these sensors. The second is uh, working very closely with Dr. Peng Chu is we're building these mathematical models to uh, help us design these sensors. And I think what's particularly exciting for us um, is that some early data, we see that these cyclic peptides, especially when they're presented on a multivalent uh, fashion on a particle is they tend to exhibit these type of uh, cooperative S curves. And that's exciting because it basically means the closer we can get it to a switch, the better the SNR would be uh, hopefully in vivo. And of course, lastly, we are going to, uh, you know, validate these sensors in, um, you know, uh, preclinical models of liver metastasis. And again, the question is, can we not just pick up these early lesions, but get information uh, as to where the, the tumors are. And you, we can compare these signals, for example, in mice that bear lung mets or bone mets uh, by comparison to see, uh, to determine the specificity and the information on location. Okay, so I'll stop here and I'm happy to answer any kind of short questions that you may have. Wonderful, thank you for that great overview and you were perfectly on time. Oh, wonderful. So we, we do have a question in the chat. Can you see that Gabe while you're sharing or do you want me to read it out uh, to you? Let me click the chat box. I'm happy to read them if easier. So I, I see one question. The question is from um, Abhinav and how does the detection limit scale for N circuits? Is it a com combination value, combinatorial value or the min max of a particular circuit? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, the detection limit is, is very similar to, um, you know, the types of, does it, the detection limit is determined by the KCAT cam for each protease substrate combination. But in this case, instead of looking at one event, we just are looking at two events simultaneously. And the question by Peter is how's location encoded? Well, the, sorry, I, I probably missed that, but the idea is that if one half of the cyclic peptide is sensing a liver, a healthy organ protease, whereas the other half is sensing a tumor protease, it's a coincident detection of them that will tell you, give you information on location. Great, thank you. And thanks to all for chiming in with questions. If you do have other questions, you can continue a conversation in the chat, but, um, you know, for some bigger questions, do feel free to carry those over to the panel session that we'll have at the end. So and next, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Wendell Lim from the University of California at San Francisco. And they have a synthetic circuit approach to focus on immunologically cold tumors such as pancreatic cancer and how to drive therapeutic T cells into those cancers. So please go ahead and, and take it away. Um, so what uh, our, our group um, in this new year one involves um, myself and Hannah El Samad, uh, who's a, uh, playing more of a computational role here, uh, and then also uh, Greg Allen, who's a MD PhD a, a, a assistant professor in Heme Ock, uh, who really is our cancer expert. But um, the the goal of our uh, uh, grant here is uh, focused on engineering trafficking circuits of immune cells and how they can be used. To, to solve really a, a really challenging problem, which is how to get T cells 
uh, into immune excluded tumors. Okay, so can everyone see the slides? I believe so. So can you go to the next slide, please? So, um, <clears throat> okay, we all know that uh, uh, we live in an era with where we appreciate the power of engineered living cell therapeutics. We can engineer CAR T cells that can have a synthetic receptor that recognizes a molecular antigen that's on a cancer cell. Can we target the T cell and kill those things? But um, next, uh, if you could forward, please. Um, but that's not the, uh, um, although we, we have to engineer a T cell to be able to recognize individual cancer cells and kill them, um, really, uh, the, this is a much more of a multi-scale systems problem. That is to say, a cell doesn't have to just be engineered to recognize the tumor, but the cells also have to be able to traffic through the body and find the tumor and enter the tumor uh, and collect there. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, for example, many solid tumors, and what, part of the reason why CAR T therapies are not uh, yet successful in solid tumors is that um, many of them have a, a highly suppressive, immune, immunosuppressive microenvironment, and uh, the, the, many of the tumors are what we call immune excluded. That is, you can uh, uh, see that there might actually exist either TILs or, or we can add therapeutic T cells like CAR T cells. Um, in this case, this is a picture of a, a pancreatic tumor. Um, with an anti-mesothelin CAR T, but um, the T cells, even if they can recognize the tumor, in many cases are unable to penetrate or infiltrate it uh, into the tumor. Um, and uh, what you see here is that the T cells, in this case, the dark brown spots are gathered at the periphery of the tumor, unable to enter. Um, so we're interested in this problem of how to use synthetic biology to try to reprogram T cell traffic. So, so not just the uh, capability of the cells to recognize the tumor and kill it, but rather more uh, multi-scale behaviors. Uh, next slide, please. And this is really a, uh, a systems problem uh, where you know, what we want is to be able to get these cells uh, to enter the body, be in circulation, but able to enter into the tumor and engage their recognition, uh, whereas in, in many cases, even if we have cells that are capable of recognizing the tumor, they're unable to get in there. Um, and so how do we um, uh, work through the mechanisms that the tumors have to evade and prevent this kind of response? Next slide, please. Okay, so um, when we break it down and think about what are the sort of molecular scale levers that we can program within T cells um, that we're gonna therapeutic engineer T cells to control things like um, infiltration into this the T cells. This is, you know, cells are uh, in circulation. They can enter into the tumor in theory. They can enter into normal tissues. We want them to be specific and to collect uh, in the tumors. And so really, um, although there are many different levers you can imagine, the ones that we think sort of are the, the easiest place for us to intervene here are the three shown here, that we can intervene with chemokine circuits that um, can, for example, uh, enhance the ingress of T cells into or immune cells into certain compartments like the tumor. We also wanna focus on adhesion molecules that can change the ability uh, the, the strength of their interaction with a particular tissue, and then could, for example, retain them in a particular compartment like a tumor uh, more effectively. And then also cytokines, things especially inflammatory ones that are proliferative that can change the, uh, the, the number of cells that collect there. Uh, and all of these really work together, uh, even in a simple kind of compartmentalized model like this to control what the distribution of the T cells are uh, in uh, normal tissues, circulation, uh, as well as in uh, um, uh, the tumors. Next slide, please. Okay, so we can, uh, in principle, uh, and, and this is, these are the parts that we're really focusing on for this problem, both using natural versions of these molecules, but also engineered orthogonal versions. We can use chemokines to attract cells of particular types and also expression of chemokine receptors to control where they go. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> in addition, we can uh, um, uh, uh, control where engineering and using both natural and uh, engineered adhesion molecules um, to control where we retain cells and their preferences and for what kind of, uh, with what kind of dynamics. And then third, um, we are uh, able to use both uh, a natural and, and unnatural and, and orthogonal uh, chemokines, could you forward please, um, that um, can expand the population and control both, uh, again, receptors and, and, and the, 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 the cytokines 
um, and, and what kinds of signals turn these things on. And, and what part of what we do, and next slide please, is to um, utilize uh, things like the synapse system that we've engineered, which allows us to sense various inputs, whether it's in the tumor or normal tissues or other places, and use that as a way to induce uh, conditionally in a spatially localized way, particular signals, whether it's secretion of a particular chemokine or expression of a particular chemokine receptor or any of these components that we're playing with. So really it's a big combinatorial uh, space that we can explore. And we're trying to understand how these can be, be used to, to enhance um, uh, uh, infiltration into these tumors in a targeted way. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, Hirsch um, Bargava is a yeah. graduate student who's working on this, and uh, he's coming up with these, uh, uh, with a multi-scale uh, platform for competition modeling all the different possibilities, incorporating these different elements. And then next slide. Um, uh, we can then simulate how cells collect in the different compartments and follow and try to understand how, the, how different circuits might work. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so that's really our plan. I just want to say that, that we're very optimistic about this. We've done some preliminary studies and with some of these prototype circuits, it seems like that it is possible to alter trafficking. This is an example of a syngenetic mouse model in pancreatic cancer where uh, a CAR-T is unable to, uh, to enter. But if we uh, add certain types of prototype uh, trafficking circuits, we can see dramatic changes in infiltration. You see on the bottom that that's a case where um, the CAR T's are now able to enter uh, the, the the tumor uh, quite quite you know well, and and this leads to, to certainly a, a dramatic enhancement in the clearance of those tumors. So next slide. Um, the uh, the goal here is that we have this big combinatorial space. We're trying to use uh, cycles of both experiment and and validation and preclinical models with the computational tools to create a cycle that helps us find what are the different spaces of circuits that can lead to different kinds of, of tracking behaviors that would be advantageous for the different tumors uh, like pancreatic, but also uh, different ones that might have different kinds of, of, of constraints. Next slide, please. Okay, and with that, let me just thank um, Hannah and Greg, and then uh, Hirsch, who's a graduate student, as I said, and then Jim Lee, who's a new postdoc. Uh, and thank you guys for uh, all of your support and your attention. So if anyone wants to put in a question or two in the chat, we have a second and I could um, read those out to Wendell um, or, or do feel free to hold some of your bigger questions that might apply to multiple projects at the end. Um, there are a few questions, right? So. Oh, good. I can't see them. I'm, I'm glad that you can. Is, um, wait, let's see. Are those, I'm not sure who those are for. <laughs> so I wonder, were those for Gabe? Maybe. Oh, here we go. Okay. A question about the, the biophysics of the tumor cell immune cell adhesive, adhesive interactions. Are those biophysics well characterized? Um, I mean, you know, obviously immune cells have a lot of different adhesion interactions and ones that are regulated um, as they form synapses and, and other things. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, there are major changes we know when they, in terms of chemokine receptors, in terms of adhesion, when they get activated. So um, I think we know a fair amount about them, but I would say there's still a great deal that we don't understand. And I think when we can go in and do things in a much more systematic way with the synthetic tools that we have or are developing, I think we will understand that um, uh, much better. But I think there's a lot to take advantage of uh, when you start uh, thinking about the different properties of tumors and, and what kinds of, uh, you know, how you can uh, leverage um, recognition of, of, you know, multi-scale aspects of the tumor. Great, thanks so much. And uh, if the attendees, if you do have other questions, you can um, continue to engage with Wendell through the chat function, but we're gonna have to move on to our next presenter. So next we have Dr. Dr. Justin Pritchard from Penn State University, where they're applying a gene drive approach for lung cancer to overcome therapeutic resistance. So Justin, feel free to start sharing and take it away. Thanks, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm really excited to be presenting on behalf of our UO1 group uh, with such a fun group of uh, speakers. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'll start my slideshow right now. Just give me half a second. So yeah, so this group um, that we're working on this concept called selection gene drives. So the idea here is a gene drive 
that rather than focusing on sort of uh, biased biases during meiosis and say a, a, a wild population of insects, it's a selection gene drive that focuses on bias selection in asexually reproducing organisms like cancer cells. And so uh, I'm the PI on this uh, U01, and my co-eyes are Shelley Payton at UMass Amherst and Michael Lee at UMass Worcester. And I'm actually in Worcester right now in a hotel room visiting my uh, collaborator for this grant tomorrow. So um, with that, I'd like to start off by talking about targeted therapy in cancer. So targeted therapies are rationally designed drugs. They inhibit specific oncogenes um, in a cancer cell. Uh, the These curves show the success of targeted therapies across multiple different um, cancer in indications, where when you run a head-to-head -head clinical trial versus a, from, for a targeted therapy versus standard of care chemotherapy, these targeted therapies tend to outperform those combination chemotherapies um, up front. However, as you can note from the fact that these are progression-free survival curves and they trend downward, uh, responses are not ideal and resistance almost invariably develops. The mechanisms of resistance are diverse, and when you follow patients being treated with therapy, you can characterize the resistance mechanisms that develop after therapy, and then you can put them into bins, you know, on-target resistance mutations. These are typically point mutations in the drug target that have been the focus of most of the drug discovery efforts surrounding drug resistance. You can also think about on-target gene amplifications or off-target mechanisms that activate a parallel survival pathway. So when we think about how to deal with these resistance mechanisms, a lot of the focus in the pharmaceutical industry has de been developing second generation drugs that target the resistance mechanisms of the first generation drugs. And so this is just sort of a, a sample simulation on the left where drug selects for a pre-existing resistance mutation. And then the idea of hitting with a second drug, right, um, is what you come along with. And this, re uh, this results in cycles right, of, of treatment and then response and then loss of response. The same thing is true if you think about treating with a secondary drug target. So this is, the idea here is in off-target resistance. So if you try to target that off-target bypass pathway, um, it's challenging to detect that, path, that bypass pathway early on in tumor development. So you have to wait until tumor, uh, until that primary resistance or that, that resistance in that off-target pathway grows out to treat with a combination of drugs. Um, and the issue here is that once you get a large tumor growing up, you have all the evolutionary risks that occurred uh, in the first tumor. So one way to deal with this uh, off-target risk conceptually is combination chemotherapy. But as I showed you, those single drugs work better than these combinations of drugs uh, tend to do. And that's in part because combination chemotherapy, when you give it systemically, uh, has issues in targeting healthy cells. And so you can't give it at a large enough therapeutic window that you're able to successfully kill the cancer cells without killing the healthy cells. So in taking a step back and thinking sort of hard about this problem, we sort of likened this process of serially dosing individual drugs to reverse engineering, whereby you figure out what goes wrong and you go make something new to solve what goes wrong. And so we thought about, well, what if we could come up with something like a forward engineering approach where from the get-go, we seek to craft that tumor cell population in maybe such a way that it makes it easier for us to treat um, in the long term. And this forward engineering approach uh, is a potentially novel solution for this idea of drug resistance. Um, and so this is, brings us to our idea for this U01, which is these dual switch selection drives. Uh, and here's how the idea works. The idea is that you have two switches uh, and you introduce them into an engineered population. That engineered population uh, is shown in green. And you use the first switch um, to in, in, uh, endow the modified cells with a transient and inducible resistant phenotype, such that when it's engaged, it acts essentially as an in vivo selection marker, and the gene drive cells grow out during targeted tumor therapy. At this point, you can then engage a second switch, and this switch, you can think of this as a payload gene, codes for an enzyme that allows gene drive cells to manufacture their own local chemotherapy, not systemic chemotherapies now. And this cytotoxin importantly is freely diffusible such that unmodified cells in the local environment can potentially be killed, especially in the case of primary resistance or that initial drug resistance. This could be potentially agnostic to the mechanism of resistance of targeted therapy because you're killing in a completely orthogonal way and you might improve tolerability because this is 
local in the tumor bed. So you might be thinking this also sounds both risky and potentially dangerous, and I think that's a very reasonable concern. We have thought about this in terms of system fail-safes, right? So we can design switch one such that the resistance mutation that we use is a resistance mutation that already has a drug approved for it. Um, and then also switch two is a second built-in fail-safe on that initial uh, resistance mutation. So we've also thought a lot about um, using stochastic evolutionary models to guide our system design criteria. So in thinking about this, We've built really large stochastic models where we ask a lot of questions about ways these, these gene drives might fail, as is shown in all the different colors. Those are different failure mechanisms popping up in these stochastic simulations and then driving to eradication at some point. Um, and we thought about this in terms of two major questions. How efficient does gene delivery need to be um, to have a therapeutic effect? And how fit do our gene drive cells need to be relative uh, to these wild type cells? And the answers to these questions make us even more excited about this system because we think we both need low delivery, perhaps less than 1%, and our gene drive cells don't seem to probably be need to be more fit uh, than the existing tumor cells because as long as they're roughly 1% of the population, they'll enjoy a population size advantage over the typical pre-existing resistant populations that occur at low values. So how might you actually build these switches? Well, we started with inducible uh, dimerization switches. So these are using dimerizer small molecules that have been in clinical development for some time and are really well, well uh, described. They can turn on the EGFR kinase, for instance, in non-small cell lung cancer with a resistance mutation in it. We've been able to build prototypes of these in PC9 cells and show that we can, uh, in the presence of dimerizer, provide a drug resistance and we can grow these cells out um, in vitro over time. We've also built prototypes of our switch two. Uh, this case is a suicide gene enzyme. In this case, it's cytosine deaminase that converts an inert prodrug into an active metabolite. Once again, remember this active metabolite needs to diffuse in order to potentially be agnostic uh, to mechanisms of drug resistance and get that pre-existing resistance um, in the case of the red cells. And if this bystander effect were not working, this, uh, this ability to kill cells and diffuse out of the producer cell, you would see uh, the entire curve lie on the horizontal, or the sorry, the diagonal line. And in fact, we see it bowing up, indicating that there is a bystander effect and we're able to kill locally. So we've built full uh, sort of prototypes of this and we've competed them against pre existing resistance in a population of cells in vitro, shown that without the gene drive, we potently select uh, for resistant cells in a period of about six days um, in vitro. If we then introduce this uh, gene drive cell into this population, we show that we can both select for this gene drive uh, population as well as suppress competition uh, with the resistance cell. And then when we turn on this switch two construct, we get the bystander effect and as shown on this inset, you can see both the population suppression effect through competition as well as the, uh, the um, diffusible killing effect of the switch two construct. And so moving forward, what are we looking to do? We're looking to expand the kinase targets. We're looking to think about evaluating mixtures of these cells in vivo. We're taking delivery off the table for now to just try to understand the clonal dynamics here and really get a good understanding of how the evolution of this system is working, both in vitro and in vivo. We're using spatial agent-based models to really think about uh, the design risks here. I mean, this is a sort of huge focus in my lab now is the spatial agent-based models of evolution and how they might um, allow us to guide uh, cell therapies. And so this is really a strong component of the grant moving uh, forward. And we have things that tie into this idea of how agnostic um, actually is this switch to. And can you then build sort of engineered microenvironments that test aspects of the spatial models that you pull out um, from in your ABMs. And so with that, I'd like to thank the group here, uh, both the grad student who's really, you know, this, this is sort of his lead project is, uh, is Scott Lehow. He's awesome. Uh, he'll be looking for a postdoc at some point in the next couple of years, uh, as well as uh, Shelly Payton um, and Michael Lee, who are my co-eyes uh, on this. And with that, I'll take a quick question if we have time. 
Thanks so much, Justin. I think we have one question in the chat that I can pass over to you. So this is a question on local release of a chemotherapeutic and why you think that would be less likely, oh, sorry, just lost the question, to reduce resistance. So. Yeah, so, so I think it, it sounds like your, your question is like sort of how does that local release um, actually provide combination therapy and stay away from resistance. And sort of the answer is you can have a larger therapeutic window with the local release. And part of it is keeping that population of primary resistance small enough, right? So that it's not evolutionarily likely to harbor um, resistance to the chemotherapy. So if you have a detectable tumor at about 10 to the eighth and a 10 to the minus eighth mutation rate, you're likely to have a resistance mutation in that tumor bed. If you have a detectable, uh, if your primary resistance is more at the level of 10 to the sixth, or 10 to the fifth cells in that tumor bed, you're a lot less likely to have that resistance mutation. And so you're playing that sort of uh, numbers game, if that makes sense. And I think there's one kind of related question asking about competition between the resistant or non-resistant cells, so cells that, that have the switches embedded. Um, just wondering how high the tumor burden you might need to get the, sorry, when the new chat comes in, I missed the last No, it's, it's okay, it's okay. So how, intuition for how competition between, yeah. So, so that's exactly one of the big things that we wanna study um, in this grant, to be honest, is how that competition works. And that's why we've moved to these spatial agent-based models and we're uh, you know, designing this, most of our experiments around understanding that better and different design ideas that we have to get around certain uh, potential failure modes that we anticipate might be a problem, if that makes sense. Thank you. And so I'm going to have to cut off the, the questions on here right now, but do feel free, Justin, to engage in the chat. It looks like you've got another question there. Okay, sure. And Thank uh, you. There, there may be things that we can pass over to the, to, the, to the panel time as well. So we are halfway through our presenters right now, and I'm pleased to introduce our fourth presenter, Dr. Daryl Irvine from MIT. They are using RNA approaches for immunotherapy via engineered therapeutic programs. So I will pass it off to you. Excited about it. Um, I'm here today uh, to represent uh, our team of, of three uh, PIs. Ron Weiss at MIT is a synthetic biology leader. Uh, Yizu Dong, our colleague at Ohio State, is an expert in uh, lipid nanomaterials for nucleic acid uh, drug delivery. And then my lab specializes in immune engineering. And the three of us have been um, working together for some time. Sorry, here's the disclaimers. Um, uh, thinking about the idea of uh, local treatments that would be administered to an accessible tumor that would induce a change in the tumor microenvironment and promote immunogenic cell death that would allow tumor antigens to be captured by dendritic cells, carry to lymph nodes, and activate systemic anti-tumor T cell responses, expansion of T cells that would not only come back to the that treated lesion, but also disseminate and destroy uh, systemic metastases. And the platform that we've been uh, really interested in as one of the strategies to do this is to use uh, engineered self-replicating RNAs as a platform for sustained expression of therapeutic programs and tumors. These are RNAs derived from alpha viruses that have uh, the really interesting property that when they uh, enter the cytoplasm, they uh, encode a set of four non-structural proteins. And those non-structural proteins form a, an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that copies the genome of the, uh, the, the whole genome of the RNA, but also makes separate copies of what's called the subgenome. And that subgenome can encode a variety of potential payloads therapeutically. And so the beauty of this system is that um, one copy of RNA delivered into a cell after a few days leads to high levels of RNA in the cell, high levels of gene expression. And when we um, encapsulate these RNAs that are produced synthetically into lipid nanoparticles and deliver them in vivo, they can express, this is looking at a luciferase reporter gene, um, they can express over really extended periods of time up to uh, more than a month. And we showed in preliminary studies, um, sort of a more straightforward strategy, not really employing much synthetic biology, where we simply uh, expressed um, uh, cytokine fusions off of replicons that were delivered intratumorally. And we used a bit of protein engineering where we would link a cytokine like IL-2 or IL-12 to a collagen binding domain, Lumican, so that when this was injected into a tumor, the uh, 
cytokine that's released from the transfected cells will be retained in the tumor by binding to collagen that's present locally. And we showed in, the, in this paper that was published last year that um, from a single uh, local treatment of one accessible tumor, you could both uh, regress the treated tumor, but also see um, halted progression on an untreated distal lesion and, and in fact lead to cures of some fraction of animals. Um, but there still remains significant room to improve the systemic immunity that we're seeing here. And so uh, what we've proposed in this new U01 program is to um, pursue uh, two main ideas. The first is uh, to engineer cell type specific ex expression so that we could deliver RNA, replicon RNA into a tumor and have one set of therapeutic programs expressed in one cell type like the cancer cell and a distinct program that might be expressed in another cell type such as immune cells like T cells. Um, and this we wanna allow to, to allow us to execute specific target goals in these different cell types. And then the second major goal is to use uh, design small molecule regulated RNAs that allow us to make staged therapeutic programs where we could have uh, variation in expression with time or have one uh, therapeutic program be followed by another temporarily that we can control by exposure to uh, an orally available small molecule drug. And then lastly, um, we're developing um, some, uh, I think, pretty interesting new orthotopic models of lung cancer to evaluate this idea in the setting uh, of treating uh, minimal residual disease. So first, um, in engineering cell type specific expression, Yuzu Dong's lab is going to be leading um, this part of the work, and he's really developed uh, a a uh, lovely approach to, uh, in, a, in a combinatorial way, vary the structure of lipid ionizable lipids that are used to formulate these RNAs, being able to change the core of the molecule, the ionizable head group, and the lipid tails in terms of their structure and function, uh, and explore a large parameter space to find LNPs that would be optimized for trans inspecting different cell types like lung cancer cells and T cells, which we think are gonna have different um, optimal compositions that would uh, efficiently and non-toxically deliver payloads into these target cell types. Um, the second part of this first uh, major aim is to be able to have RNAs that express only when they're in a specific target cell type and be able to carry out logic such as this. And we've decided to focus on microRNAs and, and design RNAs that express um, when certain RNAs are present, certain other RNAs are not present. And in our initial um, efforts in this direction, um, we uh, pursued the idea of encoding a microRNA sensor um, on a, a replicon uh, under a subgenome that expresses a, a translational suppressor, L7AE. And the vision was that when um, this replicon copies itself in the cell, um, L7E that's expressed from the subgenome would suppress a payload gene under the first subgenome on the replicon, but in the presence of uh, that target microRNA in the cell, it would retract the risk complex and lead to degradation and, and blockade of this L7E suppressor. But what we found in preliminary studies was that what actually happens is the entire replicon gets destroyed. And so to get around this, uh, Fabio Caliendo and Ron's lab developed this really clever strategy, recognizing that the poly A sequence on the replicon actually serves as a site of, of uh, initiation for the non-structural proteins to copy the genome. So when you add an additional poly A in the center of the replicon, what happens is now the non-structural proteins make two different copies of the genome. And now this creates a situation where our L7AE suppressor in the absence of the microRNA target will be suppressing the payload, whether it's on the long RNA or the short RNA, but in the presence of the target microRNA, we attract risk, we destroy the um, long copy, but the short copy remains. And now the payload gets expressed selectively in a cell that expressed that microRNA. Um, and so this is one uh, example aspect of how we're designing uh, logic into these RNA replicons. The second major goal is to uh, design switchable uh, replicons that respond to small molecule drugs. And prior work in the field has um, developed this strategy of fusing payload genes to uh, a destabilization domain, which in the steady state, in the absence of a drug, is constitutively being sent to the proteasome and degraded. But in the presence of a small molecule, such as trimethoprim, 
uh, an FDA approved antibiotic will stabilize the, the de degradation domain and allow expression of the payload. Um, what we're exploring is the idea of extending this not only to attach these uh, destabilization domains to payload genes, but also to incorporate them into the non-structural proteins in different locations to create greater control over the signal to noise ratio that you get um, in the presence or absence of the drug. And the idea here is that if we stabilize the NSPs with the small molecule, we get uh, efficient copying and, and amplification of the genome. But in the absence of that small molecule, we can greatly suppress the copying uh, function of the NSPs. And that's going to give us greater um, distinctions between our on and off state in the replicon. And this was motivated by initial work um, in the lab where we showed that if we uh, took replicons expressing a payload gene fused to a degradation domain just on the payload, then with Early after transfection, um, in the absence of the drug, there'd be a, a good low state. And when we add the drug, the gene would be uh, robustly turned on. This is a reporter gene in vivo in mice. But what we found is that over time, the replicon's copying activity makes us lose fidelity. And that DD domain is not so effective in uh, giving a strong on and off state distinction. But if we now introduce a de degradation domain that's both on the payload and on one of the non-structural proteins, in this case, linked to NSP3, um, we maintain a strong and robust on and off state difference um, that lasts over time. It takes a few days to develop and then it's very persistent. Um, so this seems like another exciting uh, innovation that we can use to control um, payload expression. And what we wanna use this for is to be able to create sequences of expression. For example, where we could put multiple subgenomes into our replicon, have one genome that might be constitutively expressing a payload like IL-12 or other immunomodulatory cytokines, and a second payload that would be regulated such that um, in the absence of TMP, our drug, we might have expression of our, our uh, cytokine payload, but we would leave off, for example, an immunogenic cell death in pro cell death inducing protein like gasdermin. But when we switch the system, gasdermin gets turned on and IL-12 gets ramped up and you'd get an induction of a robust immunogenic cell death at the selected time after we've had a chance, for example, to modulate the microenvironment with IL-12. And then lastly, so, we want- Sorry, we're right at 10, but if you want one more minute, we can skip your Q and A session. Okay. So the, the basically the last idea here is, sorry, Michelle, I uh, didn't turn on my timer quite when I first started, um, is the testis in models of lung cancer. So I'll just stop by acknowledging uh, our team members and uh, again, our acknowledge our, we're really excited to work with um, the other teams in this program. Thanks so much. There's so much good science. I know we want to dig into all of it. So I think with that quick transition, we can have a time for one question if anyone has one in the chat quickly. But um, in the interest of time, it might be best just to chat it in. And Daryl, if you take a peek, maybe you can um, give a, a written response to the question. Um, OK, just one quick question um, about alpha virus replicon size limit. So maybe if you want to work on that one in the chat, I can move us on to yeah, our, our next to. speaker. Thank you so much. So we're next going to move on to Dr. Wilson Wong from Boston University. They are working on logic car circuits with a focus on ovarian cancer for precision tumor targeting. So Wilson, you can go ahead and start sharing and um, Looks like okay. we're good, thank you. Yeah, can you can you see? Okay, um, I can turn on my video for some reason, but I guess you don't need to see me. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I wanna thank uh, the NCI, Michelle, and the NIPIB, uh, and all the program officers uh, involved in this program. We're very excited uh, to be part of this U01. So uh, yeah, if we uh, this is our, our team right here. So myself and then uh, Professor Mark Grindstaff at BU uh, Biomedical Engineering, and then also uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Yolanda Colson, who's thoric, the Chief of Thoric Surgery at uh, MGH. So we're very interested in uh, using a uh, car for, for tumor uh, cancer immunotherapy. So I don't think you need to hear too much of uh, what the car is, except that you know it's 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 been very promising, uh, for, you know, leading for you know several uh, uh, FDA approved product 
but I, I like to say that, you know, it, it, you know, as you heard earlier, there's still a lot of issues involved, many of them related to uh, uh, safety uh, issues, you know, and then also with relapse. And then one thing that I really want to stress is this issue of specificity. This is something that, that we've been thinking a lot on. Of course, some of you might also know that this is a problem, you know, a lot of people are working on, including uh, uh, Dr. Wendell Lim's uh, lab as well. So I just want to say, you know, I, I really want to go after, you know, this, this issue of, of specificity. It's really something that um, we always know what the solution is and that, but it's been very difficult to, to go after. So for example, we all know, you know, this is hypothetical uh, case where, you know, let's say these are all the normal cells that have either A or B or the normal cells are A, B, and C, but the cancer cell has only A and B. So the best way to classify the tumor cells is actually this program right here, A and B, but not C, okay? So you really think about it and there's really, you know, think about it, you know, it's easy for us to like by eye. So, you know, even doing computers or how to classify this, but how do we actually go after that cell at a molecular level or a cellular level? And then we really look at it and with all the reagent that we have, we realize that, you know, a lot of the, the, the choice of the traditional anti-cancer agents cannot do that kind of computations, right? Antibodies alone, chemotherapy or other cytotoxic agents, they can't do it, but we know that cells can do that type of computation, do that kind of logic all the time. And this is what we try to do. We try to leverage that type of innate computation capability so that we can go after this very difficult classification problem. Right? How do we go find and kill cancer cells? So, so to address this problem, I know that there's other ways to approach it. We came up with this idea called uh, uh, this system we call the supercar system. So right here, just a quick, quick overview. You know, this is a chimeric antigen receptor. It has usually two signaling domains in it. So what we have done is we basically split the car system into multiple cars such that each car recognizes one antigen. Uh, so that basically you can do a pseudo and gate. It's more like a combinatorial activation. Uh, signaling where you, you can only fully activate the T cell when you have two antigens uh, present. So this is kind of like pseudo N gate. And we, over the years, we expand the system to also include an inhibitory signal uh, into our design such that we can now do a not logic. What that means is that it can now do like A and B, but not C type of logic. So you can see here, we, we start seeing some you know pretty promising results in, in our system right here. Um, so we're pretty excited. So in this grant, we asked this question now. So we have these basic tools to do these receptor logic. Uh, we have uh, circuit in, in human primary T cell. Then, then we really want to start asking, well, how good is it at preventing toxicity? That, that's a really uh, fundamental idea. So, um, we also try to see if we can actually also further improve the, the specificity as well. So we develop a way to actually deliver our T cells, some of the reagent um, directly in the tumor by Im implanting these uh, reagent into a fiber mesh material that we can actually, after debulking the tumor, we can actually suture into the tumor so that we can have more localized deliver into the tumor. So. Now, this whole grant is really about uh, uh, using our technology, our synthetic biology technology, and some of our delivery mechanism, and really try to get to this, I evaluate it in vivo. So we, we develop an end logic car, and then we also have this not logic car, we call them the imply circuits. And we wanna see whether we can actually have tumor specificity and also minimize toxicity. So we'll, I'll share with you in a little bit what I mean by that. And also how do we deliver our T cells? How do we deliver some of these reagents also ultimately affect the tumor specificity? So we, we came up with this model system where we're gonna go after an antigen that's also found in mice, it's the RR1. So it's found to be expressed in the lung. And then we're also gonna introduce an artificial, uh, you know, a human antigen into the mouse liver, such that um, 
you know, uh, if we target either R01 or HER2 alone, it will either have lung toxicity or liver toxicity that we can measure, you know, using, you know, uh, you know see the life and death of, of the mind and also look at, uh, you know, histology. And then we have a tumor that has like both antigen. So we want to ask, well, how much off target effect can we actually tolerate? You know, so it's going to be dependent on the T cell number, the antigen expression level, and so on the T cell activity. So we really want to be able to measure that and have actual toxicity measurement come out of this. So we can have some idea the design rule, what is tolerable in terms of this off target effect. And then we, we come up with this, you know, models uh, to evaluate that. For the AND gate, and similarly for the not logic, we also will introduce another antigen where they will trigger our inhibitory receptor. In this case, we use another model antigen, just GFP, so that uh, now the GFP, the presence of GFP in the liver will now actually serve to protect the liver. Okay, and again, we'll, this you know I know this is a very artificial type of model, but it all allows us to start looking into these design rules like how much GFP uh, expression does it need to actually protect the liver so that we actually uh, don't have severe or you know, very significant uh, liver toxicity. Of course, how much of that receptor, uh, the inhibitory receptor expression, I need to also inhibit the, the, the CAR T response. So I think this is, uh, uh, these type of model will allow us to, to really go after a lot of the design rule that's specifically related to this off-target effect. So um, that's all I have. Uh, you know, this is, again, I want to, I'm really excited about our uh, opportunities here and not only the, uh, the resources available, but also the community of this UO1 uh, provides. So I'm really excited about it. So that's it. Thank you, Wilson. And uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat now, but do feel free to type something in. And I think people also may be saving up their questions for the, the panel discussion as well. But if you have anything quick, type it in now. Otherwise, not seeing anything, I think we'll move on to our last, but certainly not least presenter, uh, Dr. Amir Zaranpar coming from UC San Diego. They have been working on engineering bacteria for the detection and um, early treatment of colorectal cancer. So looks like I can see your slides and we're ready to hear from you. Thank you. My name is Amir Zaranpar. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Gastroenterology at UCSD, and I represent an interdisciplinary team of scientists from multiple institutions who are collaborating together on this project. We're so excited to have the NCI and NIBIB support on this. Uh, I'm presenting my own views and here are my disclosures. And colorectal cancer is the fourth most common diagnosed cancer and the fourth most common cause of cancer deaths. And um, though the incidence of colorectal cancer has been decreasing due to successful fecal endoscopic screening tests. There's still an alarming increase in those who are under the age of 50 who don't routinely get these screening tests. And as a result, there are still several clinical needs in colorectal cancer research, particularly in early detection of cancer, particularly in those who aren't screened, prevention of the advancement of adenomas uh, or polyps into adenocarcinomas, as well as providing localized therapy. So we believe synthetic biology tools can fill these clinical needs since the gut microflora can sense and manipulate the luminal environment. However, one of the limitations of synthetic biology applications has, this been, has been this inability to colonize conventionally raised wild type hosts, um, usually engineered microbial organisms or the chassis that we use to introduced transgenes um, cannot survive in the luminal environment for longer than 48 hours, making it very difficult for them to express functions of interest in a reliable manner. Uh, hence, engineered bacteria are often used in microbiome depleted mice, such as notobiotic mice or antibiotic treated mice. And there have been a couple of chassis that have demonstrated survival in graphene in the luminal environment, 
but they've not yet demonstrated they could be Sorry, it, uh, can you guys hear me? I guess I uh, it crashed now. on me. Yeah, it cut off, and I think we might just have to have you reshare slides. Can you guys see my slides? I think they're coming. There we go. OK, where did I cut off? Um, this, uh, you were on the slide. It was very brief. OK, so very brief. OK, so um, the idea here is that uh, these bacteria don't survive or don't survive unless you use these microbiome depleted mice, such as notobiotic mice and antibiotic treated mice. And um, the ones that do survive in conventional uh, micro fully intact microbiome mice require a tremendous amount of synthetic biology expertise. Um, so we identified the limitations of the chassis as being a major barrier of using synthetic biology microbiome applications to chronic, um, uh, I'm sorry, applications to chronic medical conditions such as cancer. So in our proposal, we identify the following critical needs. We need better chassis for transgene delivery, particularly if we can localize the chassis to cancer or precancerous tissue. And we need to identify environmental features that can signal to the chassis whether it is in a normal tissue or a precancerous tissue or cancer tissue. And finally, we need a plan to determine biosensors and biotherapeutics uh, that will eventually deliver a product uh, into the precancerous or cancerous environment. And our proposal goes to great lengths to address these specific critical, uh, critical needs. We hypothesize that native undomesticated bacteria, particularly E. coli, that are already adapted to live in this host luminal environment can be kind of plucked out, engineered to, um, engineered to express chance genes of interest. And since they were fully adapted to the host, they can go back and um, eventually be programmed to detect and treat colorectal cancers. Kind of like CAR T, but instead of using T cells, we're using uh, bacteria. Um, we performed our proof of concept studies using balsalt hydrolase as our transgene of interest, mainly because we're a metabolism lab. Uh, balsalt hydrolase um, deconjugates uh, bile acids into uh, deconjugated bile acids, which then become substrates for other bacteria to convert into secondary bile acids. So we isolated an E. coli that was native to the mouse gut microbiome. Uh, we, uh, so, which is ECAZ1, we engineered it to express uh, just a fluorescent protein, which we called ECAZ2, and then engineered it again to express basalt hydrolase. And we can track uh, BSH or basalt hydrolase activity ex vivo using these specialized plates that contain, conjugate, that contain a conjugated bile acid. And as the bacteria deconjugates the bile acid, we can see a white precipitate form around the colonies. And this way, when we are checking colonization, we can also keep track of whether uh, the bacteria can keep track of, or I'm sorry, can still express the function. So in multiple reproducible experiments, we showed that these engineered native bacteria can perpetually colonize the gut lumen of a fully conventional mouse that's never been treated with antibiotics or anything. Um, and even maintained outside of a specific pathogen-free facility um, after a single treatment. And the addition of balsalt hydrolase did not affect the engraftment of these engineered native bacteria. In fact, um, the addition of other transgenes as well did not affect the engraftment. Uh, importantly, our bacteria performed this, uh, the function that we programmed in in vivo, affecting luminal bile acids after months, um, months after a single gavage. And these bile acid changes affect the host transcriptome, particularly of a downstream target uh, bile acid receptor called FXR. Even more importantly, the changes in bile acids induced by our engineered native bacteria are able to affect host physiology. Um, in this case, uh, we show our native E. coli chassis is able to um, perform a function that improves the outcome of a glucose tolerance test in a mouse uh, in a mouse model of type 2 diabetes 15 months after a single treatment. 
Um, we were particularly excited to see work from uh, Ron Evans' lab just down the street from us that showed that FXR, uh, this bile acid receptor that our bacteria seems to be working on, um, can be potentially used to suppress colorectal cancer formation. Since uh, luminal bile salt hydrolase activity increases FXR activation, uh, we immediately realized that our proof of concept bacteria could potentially impact colorectal mm -hmm. cancer development. Um, thus, we have three aims in our proposal. The first is the hypothesis that these native undomesticated bacteria can be engineered to detect, sense, and treat tumors in genetic models of distal colon cancer. Uh, in this aim, we will test whether basal hydrolase producing bacteria can ameliorate colorectal cancer development in an animal model. Of dist uh, in an animal model. Um, uh, moreover, we will I isolate native E. coli and other bacteria from normal tissue as well as precancerous adenomas and adenocarcinomas to then de further develop our chassis and to see whether there are opportunities to um, engineer more localization to precancerous or cancerous tissue. And finally, we will engineer um, are all already isolated native E. coli to express other transgenes of interest, including target, uh, in, including um, circuits that would allow biocontainment or cytotoxicity once um, the bacteria is in the tissue. Uh, with AIM-2, we will test the hypothesis that tumor microenvironment can influence colonization and performance of engineered native bacteria, and we will do this using uh, colon organoids from healthy adenomatous and cancerous tissue and determine whether our isolated native E. coli can survive in these environments. Um, we will determine uh, the relationship of the tumor microenvironment and the native bacteria in these in, in already established and also these uh, organoid systems that we will develop. And finally, we will use mathematical modeling um, to identify genes and luminal factors that can optimize engraftment specifically to adenomatous tissue or cancerous tissue. And finally, in our third aim, we will uh, test the hypothesis that engineered native bacteria can detect and report progression from adenoma to, to cancer. And we will do this by focusing on proteases. Uh, so first, we will characterize a family of proteases, namely the cysteine cathepsins. In healthy adenomatous and cancerous tissue, we will engineer E. coli to report on already determined, um, as well as the newly identified colorectal cancer specified or adenoma specified cysteine cathepsins, which could be a way for engineered bacteria to alert uh, to the, alert us to the presence of adenomas or adenocarcinomas, and then we will determine whether we can make engineered E. coli to secrete protease inhibitors as a potential colorectal cancer therapeutic. So this proposal is a collaborative venture between a group of us who met during the SynBio meeting, uh, which I think happened uh, a year ago. Um, our team includes Abhinav Busan at Illinois Institute of Technology, who has expertise in organoid micro uh, uh, tools or uh, development tools, and uh, Mo Doss at the Rochester Institute of Technology, who's an expert in mathematical modeling. Uh, Yu Sung Ding at the University of Florida, who's an expert in synthetic biology, and Ronak Tilvawala at University of Kansas, who has expertise in proteases. In addition, we have a strong collaboration with Pradeepta Ghosh from UCSD, who will be providing the cancer expertise in our group. So in conclusion, we believe engineered native bacteria are ideal chassis that will allow perpetual colonization of conventionally raised hosts, allowing the bacteria to become reporters um, and also providing long-term treatment. Um, that these engineered native bacteria will uh, have this perpetual functional, cause a perpetual functional manipulation of the gut microbiome and host physiology and the engineered native bacteria can be used as a detector of adenomas and colorectal cancer. And uh, finally, if we can find uh, these better chassis, then we will not be that far from developing microbiome-based interventions that are more translatable to humans to slow the progression of cancer. Uh, we are looking for postdocs to help us with these experiments, so please do contact Yusung Ding or myself uh, if you're potentially interested. Thank you. Thanks, Amir, and I think you may have come to a good place with a, a, a lot of excellent postdocs at this meeting. So I see 
One question in the chat, and this is looking at the different forms of um, bile acids and their derivatives. And if you've taken a peek at the, the different forms and studied them individually. And while you're answering that, I would invite all of our presenters to go ahead and turn their cameras on now. We'll prepare for a, a panel discussion. So any quick thoughts on that, Amir? Yeah, sure. You know, there are different kinds of bile salt hydrolase and there are different kinds of bile acids that are being converted. Some bile acids are FXR agonists and some are antagonists. Uh, we picked our particular bile salt hydrolase uh, because it was very promiscuous, that it allowed the deconjugation of a lot of different kinds of bile acids. Um, and, uh, you know, since bile salt hydrolase is a very well studied gene in context of uh, bacterial gene in context of metabolism, we had a lot of a lot of people had done that footwork for us. And what this particular bile acid uh, uh, bile salt hydrolase is particularly good at is um, deconjugating um, the main antagonist of uh, FXR. So basically taking the antagonist for FXR and making it agonist. And so, um, so th we think that that's why it's particularly effective in causing physiological change. Great, thank you. So I think now we can move into our, our panel session for the meeting. We have just under 20 minutes left. And uh, I have a couple questions that I'm ready to go with, but I would also invite our audience to type in some of these overarching questions into the chat box. And if you have any that are more complicated, we definitely welcome you to, to put your hand up and we, we can let you speak directly. And of course, if members of your team want to chime in on specific questions, feel free to call out to them. So I'll get us started with the first question and then we'll um, see what else comes in from the group. So I, I recognize that we have projects that are at varying stages of development with some very early stage and some later stage. And with the meeting focusing on translation tomorrow, wanted to start to get some of your thoughts around that. I think we've been in a really good time with synthetic biology approaches, um, moving into trials and actually moving into the clinic. And um, I'm curious what kind of thoughts that you have when focusing on translation. And so maybe if I could hear from you, maybe your top one to two barriers that you're thinking about in terms of translation and any um, approach that you're really working towards overcoming those barriers. And I might flip this to Wilson first, because I know you have a recent paper out um, about uh, clinical translation of synthetic biology approaches. So hopefully it might be fresh in your mind, Wilson. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I express, well, I, I, I can say a lot of, well, in, the, in this context uh, of cancer, um, you know, I, I think, one one of the things that, that frustrates me a lot personally is it's thinking about how to manufacture these. Well, there are two things. What one is going through the design space quickly. And this is something I, I, I talked with Wendell before as well. And just thinking about how it's so slow going through the design iteration. And inherently, this is what synthetic biology is all about. It's going through the design build test cycle. It's incredibly difficult working with uh, uh, human immune cells. And then also another challenge, everybody's, uh, if, if we start building things that are more and more complicated, introducing these elements into the uh, cells become a big challenge. And I, I so, so that imposed a serious design constraint to me. It's like, well, not only can you build the circuit, you have to build them within like, you know, several KB such that it fits in into the cell. So, so there's other ways I, I, I find that, you know, either you do them genetically or you're also gonna have to do like genetic uh, and then maybe protein engineering or maybe material engineering to kind of stitch them together to form a logic. And we also exploring things, you know, I think also a lot of people in the field is like, well, we might have to do them in multiple cells. So you have to distribute the, the computation among different cell types in order to, to do that. So, but that's um, even further down the line. So, so uh, <clears throat> I'd be happy to add some stuff. Uh, I mean, we're, so we're uh, uh, involved in, in uh, moving uh, several um, combinatorial recognition 
CAR T therapies to the clinic right now and have been engaged in issues of manufacturing, uh, you know, pre IND filings, et cetera. And um, I mean, I think all, everything that Wilson said is, is correct. Um, right now, I think a lot of the, the therapies that we have to think about um, are going to be ones that are of a certain scale and where the endpoints are more modest to be able to get in through the current, uh, you know, issues, bottlenecks of, of manufacturing and regulation. I think there is an inherent problem that um, uh, the FDA, as well as, you know, the IP landscape needs to think about, which is that um, synthetic biology and with the power of it is it's a platform of, of reprogramming and there's always new parts and tools coming in. There are many variations. The power of it is that they, these are therapeutics that you can learn from what happens in a, in a clinical trial and then debug it and then come up with new versions. Something that is, is much, it's, it's more meant, it's more built like that, like coming up with a new version of Microsoft Word the next year, um, unlike uh, small molecule drugs. But, you know, when you think about uh, regulation and also, of course, IP and commercialization, um, you know, the, that world is built around small molecule drugs and, you know, it costs $5 million minimum to even do a phase one of any of these things. And so you're so invested in something that you have to decide, you know, two years before. And so there's a lot of sort of incompatibility there that I think we need to try to address at a more systemic level of how do we try more things? How do we get more shots on goal? And, um, uh, and, and set things up in, in some, some, some way. And, and I think there are some things working through. I just got the new CBER possible regulations for trying multiple um, sort of uh, gene therapy, uh, modified cell therapies uh, in, within the same I, um, IND, but, but it's, um, you know, that's, it's still a long way from, from being solved. But I, I think that's the thing I'm worried about most is like, you know, we're able to get a few, you know, philanthropic supports and CERN grants for, 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 you know, $5 million for, for one or two things, but, you know, we need to go through lots of iterations. So that's what I have to say. Any other thoughts from the group? So big concerns about complexity, funding. No, I, I was going to um, echo something that Wendell said uh, in the context of the microbiome. Um, you know, the, the mouse models that we use are very artificial um, and in, in the sense that, you know, these mice are eating the same diet or genetically identical. We house them in these sterile facilities where the bedding and everything is sterile and we struggle to get um, our uh, engineered bacteria to work in these very controlled systems. And everything that tells us about human microbiome tells us that it's going to be even more complex, that people have, don't eat the same diet every day. And as, these, as each other, there is a lot of genetic heterogeneity as well um, that makes each microbiome very particular to each individual. Um, so I think that, um, you know, uh, it's going, there's going to be a period of time where we just need to figure out what it is that um, we can use for biocontainment, what, what it is that could, like, you know, whether biocontainment is even necessary um, and things like that. And the, the barrier to doing a lot of these potential translational, just understanding the difference between the challenges uh, of the human environment are quite, um, you know, it's, it's tremendous in terms of, going through the regulatory phase as well as the cost of doing that as well so so i think um some more thought needs to be put in as to how do we get the information we need to design something that works beyond these highly contrived conditions uh in mice great thank you i appreciate the thoughts and just a couple comments and questions from the panelists um looking into translation or, or um, advancing these technologies. They were curious if any of uh, anyone on your team had gone through the i program. Any i participants here? If that ever is something of interest, we're, we're more than happy to make connections there. I think it's a really powerful approach to um, 
consider your development from the business perspective. And then any thoughts about academic industrial partnerships and if you think those might um, smooth the path uh, towards translation or designed product time. I think, you know, obviously there's, there's an acceleratory factor in raising money with, a, with uh, industry and, and whatnot, but, but I think there's also these forces that keep things down that, you know, once you have a product in line, you don't want to re, you don't want to have a new version come out, you know, and, and it takes so long to get approval. So, I mean, you do after the patent goes off, but, but, but um, that is, I mean, right now we're at a stage where we can easily make a better a much better therapy the next year than than exists you know uh, before, um, and so I you know I think that I mean there there maybe you know one space that we need to think about is some sort of pre competitive arena where industry helps support. Um, I mean right now you have like in you know, hundred cell therapy companies for example just going off in their own a lot of me too and a lot of you know and and um, or they have one key piece of of IP. Um, and you know how to bring that all together. Um, I think there there could be some space for um, pre-competitive uh, sort of assembly of core technologies, uh, platforms, et cetera, that that help move us to the next stage. Maybe that's something that you know ARPA H or other things like that could could help with. Um, but otherwise, you know, there's there, I mean. Right now, you can make a lot of money by take, starting another cell therapy company with one sort of niche, uh, sort of uh, you know element, and um, so the forces are 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 more siloing than than anything. Yeah, to add add to what Wendell's saying, I mean, the last thing that a venture capitalist wants to hear is that your plan is to iterate. <laughs> um, but I wonder, you know, maybe something for the future, Michelle, of this field is. Um, from the other side of my life in the HIV, um, the NIH has supported um, large uh, consortium centers for HIV vaccine development, where they've actually been funded at a level and mandated to take things into a clinical into clinical trials and and do iteration, um, where they partially solve the cost. Uh, problem by having NIH hold the IND and and you know uh, doing academic center based trials that are less expensive. Um, maybe this is something for the future of the NCI in this space is to actually um, create consortiums that are empowered to to do this kind of iteration that uh, probably the field needs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you check on the chat, my colleague just posted there's a through the Foundations for NIH a partnership program for accelerating cancer therapies that might be worth uh, taking a peek in. Um, and I think we have a, you know, a few remaining minutes, but I want to be clear, we certainly aren't focused on translation exclusively for this program, not so ever. It was just something that some of you touched on and we thought it'd be relevant based on the translational focus of the meeting tomorrow. But I think something else that is really important for this space is, is thinking about um, the reproducibility of these approaches and how what you're doing in your lab is going to function in the, you know, the lab across the country and would love your thoughts on what you're doing to make your technologies ready to be used elsewhere. Uh, any thoughts in that space? Uh, Justin, you seem to nod first, so I might call on you, but or or maybe no, don't no, answer just, this one. No, it's okay. I was I was I was actually just thinking about this the other day because um, it's not for this grant, but uh, for a different grant, we'd actually submitted a entire aim that was dedicated to reproducibility, and the entire idea was that myself and my co-investigator uh, were going to have two different students doing the exact same experiments in two different labs, so that the technology would be reproducible across groups. And I, I don't know, I was excited about it. I thought it'd be a great thing. And the, um, the review panel actually uh, thought that it was too much. And so I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think, I think there's a lot of things we can do beyond sort of the standard sharing of tools and standard spaces and standard places by sort of trying to write these things into our grant proposals, you know, the actual explicit reproduction of stuff into our grant proposals. And I think it's a, it's a good thing. But I also think that like, you know, it, it requires other people to buy into that being a good thing too. And, and, and want to spend the money on a, you know, R01 or a U01 for the reproduction. But I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm excited in general about writing more proposals like that in the future, because I think 
it's, you know, I think as the field moves more and more that way, it's going to be more and more exciting to include those sorts of just really nitty gritty, careful things into your aims um, and that people will appreciate it. So I don't know. That's my thought. Yeah. So oh, in the oh, go ahead, Kate. I was going to say, so in the diagnostic space, uh, part of the reproducibility is experimental design. And I know that's kind of sounds generic, but it's all about cross-validation, about designing retrospective studies that you then uh, validate in prospective studies. At least for diagnostics, you could do that. Um, and so, I mean, the, the question becomes like, how many different models uh, do you use in a pre clinical setting? Because you know, most of them aren't predictive. And so what level of confidence do you need to get before you actually, you know, raise the money to do the, the, pro, the, you know, the, the classified training in humans and the prospective trial? Uh, that's, that's a challenge for the diagnostic space. I was gonna say that I, I've been part of a DARPA grant where they set aside a huge chunk of money just for reproducibility. They had contract labs do that. Uh, and it was pretty interesting. I mean, uh, I would say, you know, the smarts of it were really, really great. I think the, the, the big issue is, um, you know, it's also, it, it, in its worst case, doubling the, the cost of doing the same research, right? And um, so, uh, I mean, I think we have to think intelligently about, we, we don't have to re replicate everything. Once you get to some stage, you know, how do you select at what stage you actually put it through that kind of filter? Um, so I think that, you know, it's equally important to, to not handicap people more, um, but to, to take the problem seriously. I just wanted to make a comment. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can ah. hear you. I, I, I do maybe want to announce your name too. I think there's too many people to see. Well, I'm Sudhir Sirvastra from uh, Biomarkers Group. I lead the cancer biomarkers program in, in, in NCI. Oh, so I just. I just wanted to hear and say kind of rejoinder to Gabe. Uh, in diagnostic workspace, you need two things to prove. One is that what is the incremental benefit that you are bringing to? Because there are already screening modality in place. So you have to keep in mind that anything we are doing in synthetic markers of IM markers that has to have some added value. Next one is what would it entail? Or what would be a for diagnostic worker? that your technology will ensue. So that also we need to be very careful about doing this as well. Um, and the third thing is obviously the cost effectiveness. Would this uh, technology provide any cost benefit over what, what we already have? And what would be its application in terms of acceptability uh, by population? Meaning that if obviously a synthetic biomarker is going to be more um, less invasive than what you do the diagnostic workup. So, Hopefully, it will be more acceptable, but at the same time, you have to make sure that it is acceptable. Thank you. Great. Thank you for chiming in with your thoughts. So we have another good question in the chat, but I'm hesitant to eat into our break because I think a lot of people will want a chance for lunch. But there is a question and maybe just um, something for you to think about. And if you have an extra time to put your thoughts in the chat about in silico testing and development, if that's something that you've been implementing and if you think that has an impact. I mean, I think several of you had modeling the components in your proposals. Any quick thoughts there? I just want to say, sorry, sorry. One thing I, I, I can worry a lot, of course, you, we have a lot of in vitro data, but a little less in vivo mouse data and even less in human, right? It is that gap, right? You know, how predictive it is from our in vitro data or on a mouse data to human. So I, I, I don't know if there are ways actually to connect them, like, you know, have, even though, you know, some predictability or what part is really predictable. I think there, there's, there's room in terms of that type of computation development and say, well, if you can predict this in the in vitro and the mouse model, we have some confidence that this might also work in, in the clinic. I think that's a really good response. Any other burning answers here? Yeah, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, there aren't that many in silico methods for the microbiome. And, um, and I think one of the exciting things about what NCI and NIBIB did with the, their SenBio meeting was put together people that, um, that that you know 
like brought it, like you know we got to meet uh, one of our co-investigators is someone who has done that before and um and to be able to now in integrate that into some of the work that we do and to form this collaboration was one of the strengths uh, of the symbio program um so i'm excited about that aspect it'd be great to see if something could potentially work without having to do a whole mouse experiment for it great well I I think we can end there. We're a little bit over time. I just want to thank you all for putting together these presentations, for really giving everyone a sneak peek into where you're going. I think it's really exciting to see what's going to happen next over the, you know, the upcoming years. And I think this group will be eager to see your updates when we have these consortium meetings annually. So thank you all very much. And, and hopefully you'll stay for a bit more of the meeting and people can um, send you chat messages or or respond with more questions, but we really appreciate you being here and thank you all for tuning in. And it looks like Dave is here to probably tell us the right thing to do next. <laughs> That's right, Just, I'm here for a run of show, right? Um, so yeah, the break is coming up. I think we're gonna get back together at one o'clock. So um, just uh, yeah, thank you to Michelle for running the session. It was awesome. And thanks to everyone who participated with their uh, cool ideas and wonderful comments. And thank you to Leslie and Manana for running the trainee session. Um, and so I, I really appreciate everyone's contributions. So I hope everyone got a little something from both of these parallel sessions and uh, hope to see you back here around one o'clock. Thanks a lot. All right. Hi, welcome back. Hope you all had a little lunch or a coffee or whatever, depending on what part of the, the world you're in right now. I know we have someone from Tokyo, so thanks for tuning in. Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to kick off this session here. Um, we're gonna just kind of do uh, a little bit of synthetic biology at the NIH, um, and it was me rapid fire. Uh, we're gonna try and get all these people in in the next 45 minutes. So, um, so Michelle, are you gonna be sharing the slide deck? All right, cool. So um, yeah, so you know, you saw quite a few names there uh, before this slide, and so that's going to represent nine different ICs plus the Brain Initiative uh, presenting today to tell you a little bit more about how synthetic biology fits within their mission. Um, and so hopefully, what you can do is, as they're talking about the mission and interests of their institutes, um, you can begin to maybe picture your own work uh, positioned within there. So because um, after this session, we'll have kind of a a few on one uh, breakout rooms where you can get to know us a little bit and our missions a little bit better. So um, I wanted to quickly point out, as I'm sure my other colleagues will be too, that there's um, a notice of special interest uh, related to synthetic biology for biomedical applications. It's a really broad announcement. Uh, it's got eight ICs uh, on it that have expressed a particular interest. That doesn't mean that there aren't other institutes and centers that aren't interested. It just means that these eight are specifically interested and want to hear from, from you about your SynBio ideas. Um, there are many different funding opportunities within that notice. So NIGMS has uh, Amira uh, FOA on there, and IBIB has its Trailblazer R21. There's the parent R01. So there's many other opportunities within this notice as well. So hopefully it's a pretty broad synthetic biology landscape uh, that can catch quite a lot of uh, projects of interest to the NIH. And for those of you that have uh, been with the NIH for several years, this does replace the old synthetic biology part, which wrapped up uh, three years now. So, um, so I'm going to quickly transition into talking about NIBIB's interests and then hand it off to my colleague, Tatiana, who will finish it off. And then we will go from NIBIB down the line through other ICs. So uh, next slide, please. And so um, if there's any one thing I want you to remember from what I have to say is that I hope you can just remember to contact a program director. <clears throat> there are occasionally really subtle differences between the missions uh, of the institutes at the NIH and nothing is more frustrating than wasting a review cycle because an application you submitted wasn't accepted by the institute because it was a poor mission fit. So reach out to us before you uh, press submit on your uh, comments page. Um, NIBIB is in general, the engineering IC, we integrate physical and life sciences with engineering to advance medical care. Uh, we do generally have a strong, um, strong focus on developing modular platform technologies 
Um, and the reason we do this is because we're, we're, we're pretty much a disease agnostic institute. That doesn't mean we don't care about the disease. It just means that it's really not uh, more important than the, the technology. Like for us, we really want that really awesome design, build, test, uh, technological achievement. Um, and in particular, we also really look for uh, technologies that have a clinical trajectory. You know, we want to see technologies going toward the clinic as opposed to maybe technologies that might end up on the researcher's bench top uh, to facilitate better research. Um, and so, um, you know, there are some ICs uh, that are like NIBIB, but many do have um, an interest in a particular disease or physiology. And so you'll hear more about that uh, soon. So next slide. And then this is my last slide, uh, just to say a few words about uh, synthetic biology in, in my division, the bioengineering division at NIBIB. Um, by and large, we're really interested in control, right? Controlling these biological substrates. And so doing it through different sensors and processors and actuators, and, and that usually manifests itself in new synthetic genetic circuits and, and transmembrane sensors and genome editors. Um, you know, all the parts and modules that it takes to establish, you know, new control over living systems. Um, and then, you know, it kind of, uh, you know, what those substrates tend to be, you know, we see lots of cells and tissues being programmed for all sorts of therapeutic and diagnostic purposes. Um, and we're starting to see um, kind of a, a bit of a new push into the protocell space and, and, and kind of biohybrid robotics where, you know, kind of bringing together the, you know, multicellular living systems with uh, some of the more engineered devices. Um, so, you know, if, if any of your synthetic biology kind of fits this, there's my information there um, on that slide. And so, you know, please uh, reach out, we'll have a conversation. And so I will now turn this over to Tatiana. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, Michelle, could you please move it to the next slide? So as Dave mentioned, I am in the NIBAB's other imaging division. And from the imaging and sensing point of view, what we are interested in is in applications of synthetic biology to develop certain kinds of molecules and systems. Specifically, we are interested in molecular agents, imaging probes, bioanalytical sensors. And here we may use the word sensor in a slightly different context than Dave did. And by sensor, we mean something that is detecting a certain molecule or biomarker, uh, mostly to detect disease or to measure its homeostasis, for example, a glucose sensor. Uh, so uh, central interest is really on the reporter genes, specifically in the field of imaging. And this could be single reporter genes, meaning where the protein itself gives you the kind of signal you can image or detect. Or it can be a dual system when the protein doesn't give you the signal of the right physical type, but then you come with a secondary imaging probe to bind that protein in detected and special application of this kind of technology is cell tracking, uh, especially these days uh, in the field of genome edited cells. NIH in the Office of Director has a whole other program of uh, somatic cell genome editing when these cells are obviously being edited for therapeutic purposes. And there we are also working additionally on the technologies to be able once they were edited to track them and see what happens to them in vivo. Interested in all the imaging modalities. We are uh, interested especially in teradiagnostics. That means that probes and molecules that could potentially have a uh, dual use uh, both in imaging and therapy. So basically overall to sum it up, the simplest approximation would be, you all know what GFP did for the field of molecular imaging in optical imaging. So we are looking for GFP analogs and systems in every other imaging and sensing modality uh, you can imagine. We can talk about it later in the office hours, thanks. I will head it over to the next program uh, officer. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so 
I'm a program director at National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, or NCCIH. So uh, I'm going to give you a high-level overview of NCCIH interest in research, as well uh, as is, uh, specifically the natural product in relation to the uh, synthetic biology. Michelle, can you advance the slide? So unlike many other ICs in NIH, so NCCIH is not an organ and disease specific IC, just like NIBIB. So we has been uh, facilitating the research and science uh, using the complementary and integrative health interventions for health. So we are particularly interested in addressing the questions like, well, what are the fundamental mechanisms underlying biological effects of complementary interventions, how useful they are, and what are the rules in improving and maintaining health, and uh, how to use them safely? That's the very key questions for us. So one might be very curious about what is the complementary, the integrative health means? So based on NCCIH definition, there are any kinds of medical health uh, care intervention, practice, and products that are not generally considered as part of a conventional medicines, uh, such as natural products and mind and body approaches. So here, I like to focus on natural products since they are the most relevant to this audience in synthetic biology. NCCIH is investigating about half of our extramural budget and portfolio to support the natural product research uh, to uh, study biological effects, underlying mechanisms or beneficial features, and their you know, interactions with the host systems. And again, uh, how to safely use the natural product. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what are the natural products? Uh, that's the key question for this audience, I guess. So they are naturally produced small molecules and biologics derived from plants, fungi, bacteria, marine organisms, or animals. So they are also exist along the spectrum of the complexity from crude extract to the purified constituents. So uh, dietary uh, supplements such as vitamin, minerals, and prebiotic dietary fibers are also considered as a natural product in NCCIH. And finally, probiotics and live microbial based therapeutics fall into the natural product category as well. So next slide. Uh, NCCIH actually provide a series of funding opportunities uh, to support the natural product research. So we support various range of studies from basic and mechanistic I mean, uh, technology method developments uh, to translational clinical trials. So we could, you could find the additional information and details of the priority and area of our research interest from this nosy that's showing in here in this slide. So move to the next slide. So I'd like to wrap up my part of the session by giving you some examples of our interest in synthetic biology in line with the natural product, uh, which also uh, described in this uh, synthetic biology nosy that David just uh, mentioned. So in this nosy, uh, we specifically ask the synthetic biology community to generate the ideas and application to address how uh, how to uh, better understand the biosynthesis and beneficial functions of natural products. So I'm not gonna read through the examples here, uh, but there are two main concepts, uh, one of which is to improve production of natural product, which is, uh, has been very challenging to get the enough quality and quantity of the natural products. So we are hoping that uh, using uh, synthetic biology technology to improve the quantity and production of the, the natural product in good quantity and good quality. And the other uh, is the synthetic biology to understand how probiotics or other complementary intervention interacting with the host gut microbiome interactions and improve the human health. Okay, I think that's all uh, for the NCCIH uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you in the office hour. If you have any question, please uh, come by the NCCIH office hour. Thanks.
Hi, so I'm Kelly Crotty from the National Cancer Institute, and myself and my colleague, Dr. Jerry Lee, will be available in the office hours after this session uh, to answer any questions and talk more about synthetic biology and cancer research. Uh, next slide. So NCI's investment in synthetic biology can generally fall into two categories. And the first is uh, synthetic biology methods to enhance our understanding of basic cancer biology. So cancer initiation, progression, metastasis, and resistance to therapy. And this includes tools on the molecular, cellular, and tissue level, as well as new animal models and new synthetic biomarkers or biosensors. And NCI has also invested significantly in SynBio approaches for new detection, diagnostic, and therapeutic frameworks. And those include new platforms for drug synthesis, cancer vaccines, oncolytic viruses and bacteria, uh, novel drug delivery platforms, um, and an increasing number of immune-related synthetic biology systems. Now, these are some examples of synthetic biology research areas that NCI has been investing in, but we're very interested in expanding this beyond uh, what you see here to any synthetic biology approach that hits on any area within NCI's mission uh, to support all aspects of cancer research and care. Next slide. So recognizing the rapid rate at which SynBio approaches have been advancing, NCA recently put together the Synthetic Biology and Cancer Program, uh, which many of you may have heard about in the previous session. And this is a network made up of six multidisciplinary teams that are applying SynBio approaches to challenges in cancer research. And there should be a lot of opportunities for collaborations with this group and affiliate membership in the future. And Michelle Bernie Lang, the co-director of this program, will also be available at the NCI office hours to tell you more about that. Next slide, please. Um, the Innovative Molecular Analysis Technologies Program, or IMAT, um, is a grant program that is exclusively focused on developing new cancer-relevant technologies. Um, and IMAT has an increasing number of synthetic biology technologies in the portfolio. And just a few examples of those kinds of projects includes um, a lineage tracing tool that uses barcode-enabled recombinant transcription to track populations of cancer cells during cancer progression. Another example um, is technology for synthetic control of enzymatic activity using a light-regulated domain that can be controlled in a temporal and even subcellular manner. Next slide. Um, so NCI is signed on to the notice of special interest that David mentioned at the beginning of the session, uh, the Synthetic Biology for Biomedical Applications, NOCI. Um, but there are some other SynBio-related funding opportunities that uh, you might want to have on your radar. Uh, new IMAT RFAs for early stage technologies using the R61 mechanism and advanced development of technologies using the R33 mechanism should be published soon. Um, there will also be funding opportunities for microbial based systems or the bugs as drugs FOAs that use the R01 and the early stage exploratory R21 mechanism. For nanotechnology based approaches, um, there's a funding opportunity using R01s. Next slide. Uh, there's also a funding opportunity out for developing tissue engineered technologies um, and an opportunity for projects that integrate experimental biology and computational modeling to cancer systems biology approaches. Um, NCI is involved in a number of bioengineering focused funding opportunities, and that includes these early stage exploratory R21 projects, as well as R01 and U01s. And these engineering oriented funding opportunities uh, seek new multidisciplinary approaches as solutions to longstanding problems in biomedical research and care. And most recently, we've released a funding opportunity um, focused on translating engineering developments into methods or tools that address problems in biomedical research or in applied research in this academic industrial partnership, FOA. So to learn more about any of these opportunities or to bounce your ideas off of us, um, please come talk to me, Jerry, and Michelle in the NCI breakout room at the office hours after the break. Thank you. Great. So um, my name is Stephanie Morris. I'm a program director at, at the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I just want to start off by thanking the organizers for having me here today to briefly discuss NHGRI's interest. Next slide, please. So NSGRI's vision is to improve human health through advances in genomics research. 
So with that in mind, we support cutting edge research in this area, as well as the development of new technologies and methods to study genomics. The technologies and methods should be comprehensive and unbiased. That is approaches and tools for assessing genomic features, structure and genomic interactions, you know, just as examples. So this would be the development of the tools as well as their application to address specific research problems. And when we say comprehensive, we are talking about high throughput approaches and on the scale of genome wide. We are also interested in generalizable methods and knowledge that is not particular individual diseases or biological systems. Whatever is being studied should be relevant to several diseases or systems. Also point out this, that this is not particular or individual genes and we don't support detailed mechanistic studies. I'm happy to discuss this further during the IC office hours. Next slide, please. So I'll also point out that in 2020, NHGRI published the Nature is Strategic Vision for the Field of Genomics, which highlights some of the highest priorities raised by the community. In reviewing the vision, this will give you a sense of what we are trying to address at the Institute through the support of investigative initiated projects and the development and implementation of new initiatives, programs, and policies. You can read more about this at our genome.gov website. You can also follow the link on that page. What I will say here though, is that the strategic vision is divided into four major areas. Uh, two areas that you might wanna check out are one on compelling research projects and the other one is breaking down barriers that impede progress in genomics. Next slide, please. So highlighted in this section on barriers is uh, enabling synthetic genomics. This would include the synthesis, modification, and perturbation of nucleic acid sequence at any scale, and a development of methods to introduce synthetic constructs into mammalian cells. So we support this type of research in both research projects and centers. An example of this would be Jeff Boca's Center for Synthetic Regulatory Genomics. And if I was really on the ball, I'd have an example on the slide, but I'll just talk through it. So uh, this is one of our centers of excellence in genomic science. His center is designing large synthetic constructs on the order of 100 KB to probe gene regulatory function and developing computational models to predict regulatory effects. And his group and just the rest of the team are using this to assess genomic variation and to understand enhancer function. I'll also point out that we're assigned onto the SynBioNOSI. And uh, in the notes, you'll see that we encourage SynBio approaches that are relevant to genomics, surprise. Um, this would include the development of synthetic genomic tools and approaches for genome-wide study of genome organization and function. And there are a few other things listed there as well. And this includes um, synthetic tools and devices using them for functional genomic analysis, and also novel methods and tools for the design and synthesis of nucleic acid molecules with defined sequences. And so for this NOSI, we are accepting applications in response to the parent R01 announcement. Next slide, please. And so lastly, I'll mention that NHGRI has a set of RFAs published that are focused on novel synthetic nucleic acid technology development. So this is a call for the development of technology for generating oligonucleotides and synthetic nucleic acid constructs. We are funding research efforts in novel enzymatic, biological, chemical, and physical approaches, along with instrumentation. I've listed here the R01, but in this announcement, you'll see links to the R21 and small business announcements. Uh, those that receive awards to this RFA actually become a part of our genomic technology program, which also supports sequencing and other genomic technologies. So the next due date for all three is February 4th. And I also pointed out here, because this is an RFA, we have 3 million, 3 million uh, set aside per year and fiscal years 21 through 23 for the R01 and R21 announcements. So I'll stop right here and just thank you. And I'd be happy to discuss any ideas or to take questions during the IC office hours. Hello, uh, my name is Rahul Thacker. I'm a program director at the Advanced Technology and Surgery Branch uh, within the National uh, Heart, Lung, Blood Institute. And it's NHLBI, again, Heart, Lung, Blood. Uh, but uh, let's not forget our friends in the Center for Sleep, Sleep Disorders. They're also part of NHLBI. Um, I wanna give you a brief overview of what exactly we do at NHLBI, what we're doing within our branch, and then uh, three opportunities where uh, anyone interested in uh, synthetic biology, engineered systems, whatever, 
uh, would be uh, would be very welcome to apply and uh, seek out any one of us for more uh, uh, input and whatnot. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the disclaimer disclosures, um, they are what they are. Uh, next slide, please. So long story short, NHLBI has a very broad uh, bench to bedside uh, program. We use our funding to find out the very uh, essence of the mechanisms behind cardiovascular disease, uh, blood disorder, anything with the with the pulmonary system, and then the center of sleep uh, center of sleep disorders as well as involved with all of that. Uh, we have robust tools that are uh, that facilitate our clinical trials as well as a lot of the mechanistic research. Uh, the key thing is we want to tr uh, treat and prevent heart disease and the associated disorders. Um, specifically, the advanced technology and surgery branch uh, uh, from which I, I come from, uh, we are within the division of cardiovascular sciences. And specifically, we're looking at technology. Uh, all of us, all the program directors have some sort of engineering or physics background. And the, the bullet points uh, uh, are, are below where we have our focus. Uh, it is extremely technology driven with a focus on cardiovascular sciences and disease. Uh, the key things where I feel synthetic biology can make a real impact are as we move forward in therapeutics, specifically gene and cell therapies. Uh, there's a lot of synergy with the omics and data sciences. And I think there's, as uh, a previous uh, speaker alluded to, there are opportunities within imaging, imaging focus for solely the, uh, the cardiovascular or, uh, or pulmonary system. And of one note, uh, the majority of the SBIRs that are funded at NHLBI, they end up within our branch because most, most of them have some sort of product widget, what, whatnot, uh, that is the uh, deliverable and it aligns with our branch's goals. Next slide, please. And so these are the three opportunities I wanted to allude to. First is top med. Uh, NHLBI has, is very, very focused, very determined to push its data sciences and precision medicine uh, efforts forward. And top med is our, our foremost effort. Uh, it's an incredible resource with a, a great deal of data. And within that data, I feel that there are opportunities for somebody who is interested in synthetic biology that's uh, aligned with NHLBI's aims to find pathways uh, potential targets, whatnot, where synergies could exist and you could gain access to this uh, database. Uh, the next one is a NOCI, uh, or pardon, uh, it, it is listed as a NOCI, but it does have a set aside, which is somewhat rare at NHLBI. Um, NHLBI tends not to have uh, R21s, but my second bullet point, the bold new bioengineering research for heart, lung, blood, sleep, uh, blood and sleep disorders and disease, that's one of the rare R21 opportunities at NHLBI. And this is a very focused bioengineering uh, um, RFA for, for the uh, uh, points below. And again, I think there is synergy with, with synthetic biology and, and this uh, funding opportunity. If you don't align with this necessarily, your best bet will be an R01 or coming in if you're an ESI, a CATS R01. And I can talk to you about that in, in shortly. And then the last uh, opportunity is in uh, late spring, early summer, NHLBI will be hosting uh, its synthetic biology workshop. And the purpose of this is there's existing efforts as we're learning about today, but NHLBI, it needs to up its game a little bit in, in synthetic biology. And this is an opportunity for us to identify gaps and see areas for synthetic biology that align with the aims of NHLBI and then bring them together and move forward. Um, we, in an ideal world, an outcome would allow us to create an RFA or a NOC sign on uh, with this existing one, something where we could even you know, dream of having a set aside and, uh, and, and trying to push for that. At minimum, it'll give us a justification to move forward and, and join a NOC as this existing, the current existing effort is, is in play. Um, we are in the process of working with other program directors within H NHLBI. There's about six or seven of us, and we're all spread out in the various aspects uh, of NHLBI. And we're putting together the program. Uh, we're identifying a, uh, a chair, and we'll move forward, and we'll start advertising it once we have uh, 
uh, a solid program to come forward with. Uh, that's all I have right now. If you have any further questions or anything I can help you with, uh, I'll be around at the, uh, at the two o'clock session. Thank you. My name is Ron Kohansky, and I am the director of the Division of Aging Biology at the National Institute on Aging. Um, and NIA has uh, a mission to improve the health of people at older ages. We're also one of two institutes along with NINDS with major responsibilities uh, for addressing Alzheimer's disease. But the presentation I'm going to make today about synthetic biology really has to do with aging uh, in general. So unlike diseases, and aging is not a disease, it's this broad loss of function. And along with the loss of function or loss of defenses against diseases, uh, but there are multiple molecular causes for aging. Uh, these are considered uh, nine hallmarks of aging that were described in 2013 publication itself. And the, one of the problems that we have is developing biomarkers for aging. We have physiological markers, which are losses of function, clinical characteristics, but at the molecular level, because of the complexity of aging, because of the heterogeneity of aging, and that inherent heterogeneity in all biological systems, having biomarkers that are selective for specific aspects of aging uh, is a problem or for general aspects of aging. And there's a move in the biotech sector right now to try to develop anti-aging therapeutics called gerotherapeutics uh, from the Greek word geron meaning old man. There are also pushes to develop geroprotective uh, protocols the most famous of which are diet and exercise. Uh, but what we would like to be able to do is to have some diagnostics that uh, report aging, whether they report them in multiple tissues or single tissues. So we think that a synthetic biology approach is really critical for this. And as Tatiana uh, described earlier, um, we, are, we are also interested in uh, reporters, tracers, and imaging and things that will diagnose uh, an aging rate or an aging phenotype. So what we think could happen is that the, um, there aren't any good biomarkers of aging at the moment, uh, but most of them are sought for in the circulatory system. But we know from some of the experimental work done in a peculiar protocol called heterochronic parabiosis, which is the joining of the young and an old animal together usually a mouse, sometimes a rat. Uh, so you join them together and what you find is that in the young animal, they seem to be older in many respects, but also in the old animal, they also seem to be younger. An example uh, would be repair of muscle after an injury. In this situation where the young is exposed to an old environment, the repair of the injured muscle is slower, less efficient and shows greater fibrosis. So what are the molecules that are involved in that? We don't actually know. There are a lot of candidates, in fact. But one of the things that we think could be done is to engineer uh, reporter circuits in cells that will pick up low abundance um, indicators of the aged phenotype from circulation. We know they're in circulation because of the experiments I just cited that are chronic parabiosis. So we think that synthetic biology can help in this respect to test serum from older people who have been clustered by health metrics. So we know that people who are 65 have a range of health um, characteristics, and these can be analyzed uh, through uh, physiological and clinical uh, metrics. And so we think that if you can test for these, build a reporter and test for it using the serum uh, approach, that would be good. But part of the validation here is important, and that's to distinguish between chronic and acute conditions. As an example of what that problem is, uh, if you have, uh, if you're running a fever, you have an infection, you'll have an acute inflammation. If you have a wound, of some kind, or just a new surgery, a number of conditions will cause acute inflammation, which is beneficial for repair and recovery. On the other hand, chronic inflammation which uh, we don't really know all the differences between the two, but chronic inflammation is generally speaking deleterious. So that's the broader scope of the problem, detecting something at low abundance, 
uh, and having some way of reporting for uh, heterogeneity of the aging characteristics. NIA signed on to the Notice of Special Interest EB20017. This and a few other uh, topics are laid out there. I'll be at the um, session at two o'clock if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, hello, uh, my name is Bridget Sanders and I'm representing the synthetic biology interests of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, better known as NIAID. I don't have to tell you by now that NIAID's mission is to conduct, uh, next slide please. Um, NIAID's mission is to conduct and support basic and applied research to better understand, treat, and ultimately prevent infectious, immunologic, and allergic diseases. As you know, NIAID has a unique mandate which requires the Institute to respond to emerging public health threats. This mandate has been most recently employed to combat the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. The extramural NIAID has three scientific division, the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, which handles all infectious bacteria and viruses except the immuno, a human immunodeficiency virus. The Division of AIDS, which supports HIV research as well as HIV-associated co-infections, such as tuberculosis and hepatitis B, and the Division of Allergy, Immunolo Immunology and Transplantation, which supports research on allergic, autoimmune and organ transplantation related diseases. All three divisions work closely with other ICs to complete their mission. NIAID currently supports 49 investigator initiated grants with the RCDC term synthetic biology. Next slide, please. Um, as many other ICs, NIRD also participates in the NOSI Synthetic Biology for Biomedical Applications. We encourage collaborations among synthetic biologists and infectious disease specialists. And the NIAID specific interests are listed here, which are basic research, including novel cell, tissue, and animal-based model systems to better understand the complexities of infectious disease and immune disorders tools and technologies to facilitate designing and developing novel sensors, therapeutics, antibodies, or vaccine approaches, and translational and clinical studies for precisely detecting, targeting, and treating a wide range of infectious and immunological diseases. Next slide, please. This slide shows two systems biology initiatives at NIAID. These aren't pure synthetic biology for us, though elements of the application include, could include synthetic biology techniques. The first is about systems biology for infectious diseases in general, which is a reissue, and the application due date is January 14, 2022. The main points are to provide novel insights into complex relationships between the pathogen and the host, to reveal potential biomarkers to predict disease onset, severity, and progression, and response to therapeutic interventions, and to identify targets for new therapeutics and intervention strategies. And the second one is an ongoing contract with, with the University of Washington in Seattle about a non-human primate core functional genomics laboratory in support of AIDS vaccine research and development. This concludes my presentation about NIAID's interests and my colleague Reed Shabman and I are looking forward to answer your questions during the ICR office hours at two o'clock. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Tuba Fear and I'm a program officer at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, I'm trying to push the full screen. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I have nothing to disclose except that I love synthetic biology. Next slide, please. Um, our mission at NICHD um, is to lead research and training to understand human development 
improve reproductive health and enhance the lives of children and adolescents and optimize abilities for all. So we have a pretty broad mission. And even though our name has child health in it, um, we are interested in all stages of life, including pregnancy, childhood, um, adolescence, and adulthood. Next slide, please. NICH, the Division of Extramural Research, consists of 12 scientific branches and the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research. I want to go over these branches briefly just to highlight the variety of areas that we uh, fund at NICHD. These include child development and behavior, contraception research, developmental biology and structural variation, fertility and infertility, gynecologic health and disease, intellectual and developmental disabilities, maternal and pediatric infectious disease, obstetric and pediatric pharmacology and therapeutics, pediatric growth and nutrition, pediatric trauma and critical illness, population dynamics, pregnancy and perinatology. As you can see, we cover a wide range of um, areas when it comes to scientific interests. Next slide, please. When it comes to synthetic biology, we have multiple branches that have an interest and have funded research. Um, and um, the areas of synthetic biology that we have, um, we are interested in include developmental biology, um, that is my background, um, regenerative medicine, synthetic microbiome. Next slide, please. Drug development and synthetic chromosomes. So you can see that a lot of the branches at NICH have an interest in synthetic biology. Next slide, please. When it comes to funding opportunities, I want to highlight the um, notice of special interest that my colleagues alluded to previously, uh, the synthetic biology for biomedical applications. And ICHD is also uh, signed on to this NOC, and I want to highlight two um, uh, types of uh, projects that you could apply to. Um, those are the R01 and R21 mechanisms, and you can apply to these through the parent FOAs, um, and NICC would accept both, uh, both types of applications. Next slide, please. When it comes to the research topics that are of interest to us that fall within this NOC, include but are not limited to um, transgenic synthetic biology tools and approaches in especially animal model systems. We are interested in animal models and the whole animal. Um, and we are interested in studying embryonic development in the context of animal models. Um, and uh, some examples include synthetic gene regulatory networks, and functional tools for functional validation of gene regulatory network architectures, um, in vivo lineage tracing and or engineering tools, for example, um, cellular memory devices or um, other tools to um, direct differentiation of certain cell types in the embryo. Um, another area is engineered pluripotent cells and organoids to advance birth de defects research synthetic biology tools for studying embryonic morphogenesis and endogenous tissue regeneration, diagnostic, prognostic, predictive, or therapeutic synthetic biomarkers, and delivering therapeutic payloads to targeted tissue niches. Again, we have a variety of areas that we're interested in. I'm happy to talk to you about your ideas um, during our um, office hours. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Bond, and I'm from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. And I'm pleased to have the uh, opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what we do here today, uh, as well as during office hours. Next slide, please. And you can go through to the bottom where all of the text is showing, please. So NIGMS is an institute that supports research efforts that are at the foundation of our understanding of biological principles that are required for disease diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. NIGMS's mission is quite broad and it supports research that answers questions about the principles, mechanisms, and processes within living organisms, as well as the development of technologies and met methods that will achieve its mission. It's worth noting that GM supports research in specific clinical areas that affect multiple organ systems, 
but that's likely beyond the scope of our discussion today. And should you be interested in that, in that I recommend you take a look at our website. So NIGMS is interested in supporting a diverse scientific and diverse um, biomedical workforce. And synthetic biology is not centralized in one area of NIGMS. So I recommend you look at the synthetic biology NOSI that has been mentioned multiple times today. Um, this outlines some of the areas that we are interested in. And if you are interested in areas that are in, uh, uh, include um, uh, natural products, um, that's something that you might likely uh, speak with me about. Uh, further, I, I recommend you take a look at our website for our, our areas of interest. Next slide, please. What I wanted to spend most of my couple of minutes talking about today is bringing your attention to a few funding opportunities that might be of interest to you. Acknowledging that NIGMS is largely supportive of investigator initiated efforts. Uh, the first is the NIGMS MIRA, which is under the uh, R35 activity code. And this is an opportunity for an individual to apply to pursue research within the NIGMS mission that's not adhered to specific aims. There are two funding opportunities that are in different flavors. One is for established investigators and one is for ESIs. Each has its own uh, unique eligibility criteria. And I recommend that if you are interested in this, you reach out to me or the program contact after looking at our dedicated webpage. And please keep in mind that there are also criteria such as a requirement for 51% of research effort. The second thing I wanted to highlight is a pair of funding opportunity announcements that are focused on technology development, an R21 and an R01. The R21 is intending to support uh, technology at its earliest stages of development when it, with an intention to support novel concepts that have not yet been tested for feasibility. Importantly, in this particular FOA, no preliminary data are allowed within the application. The Paired Technology Development R01 is intended to support products, projects that need technical work to produce a useful prototype and these applications cannot include untested biomedical hypotheses. Um, that, that type of thing should be saved for a parent R01 application. Lastly, like many other ICs, I think it's important to note that NIGMS has great interest in supporting efforts that are moving toward commercialization. And we do that through supporting small businesses, through SBIRs and STTRs. I look forward to speaking with uh, you during office hours and uh, thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Richardson and I am here representing the NIH Brain Initiative. Next slide, please. Uh, nothing to disclaim or no disclosures, next slide. So uh, kind of in contrast to uh, the presentations you've heard up till now, uh, the NIH Brain Initiative or the Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies is not an institute or center in and of its own, but it's really uh, a congressionally mandated uh, uh, collaboration among 10 different institutes and centers across NIH. So really the, the goal of this trans NIH initiative is to revolutionize our understanding of the human brain by really focusing on the acceleration and development of uh, novel applications and novel technologies. So really looking to leverage these technological innovations to enable new discoveries about neuronal circuit function, and then uh, later using these discoveries as really the foundation for, for new therapeutics and, and strategies, particularly emphasizing uh, human uh, brain disorders. And ultimately with the Brain Initiative, there's a very strong emphasis on dissemination and democratization of these technologies. It's not enough for us to be developing these tools in the lab, but we really want to ensure that they're getting in the hands of, of researchers and clinicians. Uh, I do have to say here that um, similar to NIBIB, uh, while the focus here with the Brain Initiative is very squarely on the central and peripheral nervous system, um, we are very much disease agnostic and, and really focused on the development of, of technologies. Next slide, please. 
So here on the left, I've listed out uh, some of the seven, uh, the seven different priority research areas as outlined in the Brain 2025 uh, Strategic uh, Planning Report. And, and you'll see that it really covers uh, quite a gamut, uh, ranging from uh, the understanding of, of an identification of particular brain cell types to thinking about collections of, of these cells, right, neural circuits, and then ultimately uh, uh, full brains as we consider uh, human neuroscience as well. Um, click through, please. Um, but I wanted to highlight these particular areas that are really focused on, again, the development of technologies and to abstract a little bit more beyond the, the seven research themes to really uh, highlight uh, some um, cross-cutting uh, efforts uh, that are really central to the BRAIN initiative. So first, really uh, one of the major goals here is uh, to develop and, and innovate around uh, tools to both uh, to map and model uh, different uh, cells and circuits, but ultimately to be able to uh, monitor them, to uh, record from them, and ultimately the hopes of manipulating them. And, and again, uh, we'd like to do this with a, a particular emphasis on precision, right? Precision both uh, temporally, but also spatially as well, both at the cellular level and subcellular level. Um, there's also a very strong emphasis on scalable technologies with the BRAID initiative, uh, a very strong emphasis on uh, not just being able to manipulate individual cells, but uh, collections of cells across the brain, uh, again, with the, uh, with the goal of precision as well. Um, uh, an emphasis on invasive and non-invasive methods, uh, particularly as we think about um, translating some of these tools and technologies for uh, human diagnostic and therapeutic potential. So in the next few slides, uh, I want to go through examples uh, in our portfolio uh, to highlight uh, instances where I think uh, the synthetic biology community um, can, can play a really significant role in, in furthering the, the development of some of these technologies. Next slide, please. Uh, these first few uh, highlights are really focusing up on tools that can both map and, and model uh, different systems. Uh, unfortunately, both of these RFAs are closed, uh, but I think the, the first RFA uh, for under mapping, uh, we're looking to reissue, reissue in the next uh, year or so. Uh, and here, just again, highlighting uh, on the top, um, tools to facilitate high throughput microconnectivity analysis. So uh, in one instance, we see here uh, a method for uh, looking at long scale uh, connections between neurons using a uh, DNA barcoding uh, sort of methodology. Uh, in, the, in the bottom, uh, we see a couple uh, examples of different efforts to develop uh, new model systems for understanding uh, uh, um, brain physiology. Uh, so one example here is uh, not just thinking about brain organoids, but thinking about um, combinations and, and assemblies of, of multiple different uh, cell organoids developed from multiple different cell types, um, creating these um, uh, really interesting um, brain assemblyoid circuits. And then uh, we fund uh, quite a few efforts in the non-human primate uh, genome editing space uh, to develop new technologies for, uh, for those areas. Next slide, please. Um, however, I think the uh, the areas that are really most ripe for uh, investment by the synthetic biology community are with uh, developing tools that can uh, either monitor or manipulate uh, neuron uh, physiology. Uh, so we have a variety of, of FOAs in the space, funding opportunities in the space, um, really covering the gamut of, of development, uh, starting with early development, uh, new concepts with the R21 mechanism, and then more mature efforts that are uh, more milestone driven with some of our cooperative agreements. Uh, I should also say here that uh, with the BRAIN initiative, there's a very strong emphasis on uh, team science. So we definitely encourage uh, uh, we definitely recognize and encourage the fruitful collaborations that can um, come from uh, truly transdisciplinary teams. Um, so uh, in, in the monitoring space, uh, we support a lot of efforts to develop uh, new biosensors. So thinking about next generation uh, voltage indicators, for example, and we have a lot of uh, uh, support, a lot of grants in uh, the uh, biomolecule sensor space as well. Um, targeting uh, specific cell types uh, and developing technologies there is, is also a major effort of the BRAIN initiative currently. We have a new transformative project that we're standing up, really focused on developing a toolkit to be able to um, access and manipulate uh, any cell type in, in 
the uh, in the brain across different vertebrate species. So that's something we're quite excited about. And then lastly, thinking about the actuator space, thinking about how we're able to manipulate these cells. Uh, certainly optogenetics has been rather transformative for uh, the neuroscience fields, but we're also looking for the next generation of tools to manipulate cells. In particular, I highlight here both sonogenetics and methanogenetics because of the potential there for non-invasive manipulation. Um, and thinking beyond these as well, I, I think there's a really uh, interesting and exciting opportunity to think not just discreetly about monitoring and manipulating separately, but to think about uh, systems, control systems, where we can both um, sense and respond uh, to, to particular stimuli. And uh, this is something we're really excited about, the Brain Initiative, and it's something that we've um, really been uh, um, supporting uh, in the device space um, with some of the closed loop um, stimulation devices. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just here to uh, quickly highlight uh, some other themes. Uh, at the Brain Initiative, we very much recognize that in order to unlock the mysteries of the brain, we need to leverage all of the talent and expertise in the biomedical research for workforce. And I hope today I provided some insight into how your particular interests, uh, how the interests of brain rather, uh, might align with your particular scientific pursuits. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our workforce development words and, uh, and particularly our growing budgets. Um, so I, I definitely encourage you to check out the resources we have on the web in terms of our funding opportunities and training resources um, and also our brain blog to get a sense of, of some of the uh, interests of the brain initiative. Um, and I will be happy to take any questions now or later during the uh, office hours. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And, and thank you to um, all my colleagues uh, from the NIH who took some time to uh, share with everyone uh, about uh, how synthetic biology fits within your institutes. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention um, kind of a, a comment from uh, uh, Wendell in the last session about kind of his seeing the trajectory of synthetic biology at the NIH over the last 15 years. And, and I think he was pleased with the trajectory. Um, and, that's, and that's because of all of you who just presented now. So, you know, to, to echo um, uh, Tuba's uh, comment, uh, you know, I, I disclose that I love synthetic biology too. So thanks to all of you and your passion for the topic uh, that, that helps to bring it into the NIH. So um, thank you everyone. I'm just gonna take one last minute here to wrap up the, the day here. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed uh, the, um, the, the, the Symbio um, at the NIH uh, session followed by the, uh, the individual breakout rooms. We got a chance to uh, talk with some program directors around the NIH. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, so when you come back again tomorrow, I hope you can, as, as your schedule permits, we'll be again starting at 11 o'clock. Use the same link that you used uh, today to join us. Um, and I think with that, I will say one final thank you and hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everyone.